good evening. My name is Dr. Lucy Arnold of the University of Worcester, and it's my enormous pleasure to be here today with Ben Miles, who is currently preparing to reprise his role as Thomas Cromwell in the final stage adaptation of Hilary Mantel's Tudor trilogy. Um, so welcome, Ben. It's really lovely to be with you. Hi, pleasure. So, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. I wanted to kick off by thinking about the man himself, Thomas Cromwell. Um, obviously, you will have first encountered Hillary's Cromwell, like the rest of us, in the novel Wolf Hall. So I really wanted to kick off by asking you about your experience of encountering Hillary's Thomas Cromwell for the first time. How did you respond to the character? Was there a particular moment where kind of you really felt that, that this is the moment that captures who this man is? Gosh, it, I have to go back... Um to 2013, like the spring of 2013, um, when uh, I was I was offered the role of of, of Cromwell. Um, I had I'd been aware of the books. My parents, my mum particularly, my late mother particularly, loved the books. Spring at the Bodies, I think, was one of her favourite novels ever. Um, so I was aware of, 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 of the potency of the books, um, but I hadn't actually read them properly. Um, I sort of dipped into Wolf Hall, but when the offer came through from the Royal Shakespeare Company to play Thomas Cromwell, A, I was completely thrilled and gobsmacked, but then began the proper <clears throat> investigation into the, into the whole of the story. And I remember I was working in Budapest. I was doing a series in Budapest, and uh, I took the book along with me both books and um it, it it felt it was as if i was I, I i was right back there in tudor england i wasn't in hungary i wasn't in budapest every time i opened the book i just it was like alice falling down a rabbit hole it was it was so compelling uh and the world and the characters were conveyed to you in such beautiful detail um that i was instantly engulfed in that world and instantly adored being alongside Thomas Cromwell inside his head sitting alongside him I found him fascinating from the start um, that was my first encounter with him um, and I've he's sort of been with me ever since really um, as for a kind of moment in the, in the in the story that made me think yeah I kind of want <sighs> The, the moment that really kind of pulled me in and hooked me in. I'm trying to think. There are so many. Um, I think it was actually really his his childhood, his boyhood. Mm. Um, there's a section where Hilary describes him walking along the riverbank in London, along the bank of the Thames, with a slightly slight sick feeling in his stomach, knowing that he was going back home. I think he'd been out just playing by the riverbank all day and he had to go back it was getting dark and it was really that that child that very intelligent um dominated by his father a sort of a sensitive intelligent child being brought up in a very kind of rough violent household but with curious avenues of of comfort from his sister cat and uh interesting interesting sort of uncles and relatives that he could escape to and ask questions of um it was really that that that, that drew me in i sort of instantly f fell for that child i instantly wanted to wrap him up and take him away from the horrors of putney um, and I was fascinated to see how that child became the man. Um, and it's really that, um, that was the point really where I went, okay, I'm in, I'm really in now. I want to know what happens to this kid. Absolutely. I think it's, it's a really remarkable element of that first text, this evocation of this childhood. I'm, I'm thinking particularly mm -hmm. of the moment where he observes the, um, the execution of the Lola being burnt alive and how exactly. visceral... Yes. That yeah. moment, yeah. it's almost kind of becomes part of his makeup, almost physically, that feeling of the kind of the grease on the back of his hand and the soot that kind of stays with him and, and forms yeah. him. Yeah. Um, and again, a huge kind of 
achievement, I think, of what Hillary does in the book is take this man who, certainly before I had um, encountered the books, I knew from the Holbein portrait, and that was it, um, and found the, the Holbein portrait actually quite um, opaque, really, didn't yeah. feel a connection to that figure. Um, so taking that, the image of that man and finding that little boy within that image, I think is really remarkable. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of, of Hillary, um, could you say a little bit about what it's been like to work with her? Because my understanding is you have a very close working relationship and especially on this play in particular, your kind of collaboration has, has taken on kind of a slightly new quality, especially with um, the move in terms of the work on the script. Would you be able to talk a little bit about working with Hillary and, and how that's developed? Yes, absolutely. It, I, it, I first met Hillary in the rehearsal room at the Royal Shakespeare Company in London, uh, in, in uh, South London. Actually, enough, where we're rehearsing right now for this third play. Um, it was at a very early read through of a very early draft of the stage version of Wolf Hall. And I was, I was, I was completely starstruck because I'd read Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies a few times by that point. And um, I didn't know quite what to say to her. Uh, and I remember going up to her and saying, hi, I'm Ben, I'm playing Thomas Cromwell. Um, I just want to say how much I love your books. And then something sort of fell out of my mouth, which was I've now learned, or rather I think you've taught me what it is to be English, by which I mean the, the myths of Englishness, by which we, I think, still all live often, were explained to me in those books, particularly in the section of Wolf Hall, which is called An Occult History of Britain. Um, these stories, these ancient stories that have fabricated our sense of ourselves up until the Tudor era, which again in itself was such a sort of factory of myth for Englishness as well. Uh, which again is described in the books in such brilliant detail, how Henry, how there was a whole kind of PR drive at the time to liken Henry's England to this idyllic land of Albion. They were often harking back to the times of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It was it was a very, rather like today, There's a there was a very strong PR drive on what it means to be English and how wonderful it is to be English and how unique the English are in the world. Um, but I guess back then it wasn't so much the it wasn't so much global Britain. It was kind of English England. That was that was the drive, and that was the story that everybody was telling themselves. So, <clears throat> I had a brief discussion with Hillary first off when I first met her, and she she appreciated that I think, and she understood that I felt how important that that sort of theme was central to the books, and I think she I think she was glad that I was. I had that sort of take on the on on the stories. Um, from that point on, she was she was present in rehearsals, but not there all the time. It was it was new for Hillary this how to how to be in a rehearsal room, how to, you know how to be in a in an environment which creates theatre, which creates stage plays. She was she'd never done it before, even though as I'm sure she's told you, she was. She'd been going to the RSC since the age of 12 and was a huge fan of theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. But her role in those early, early weeks was not that well defined. Um, so she'd come in every now and then and make, um, and make the odd kind of absolute gem of a comment, <laughs> um, and which would move things on in leaps and bounds in terms of one's own imagination and one's understanding of the character, not just for myself or Cromwell, but for every actor in the room everybody was saying oh my goodness it's so good to have hillary here just to ask her the funniest question about stuff and get such wonderful feedback from um i our kind of working relationship began we first performed wolf hall and bring up the bodies in stratford on avon in the winter of 2013 and funny if i was just looking at an email before we started this interview which i have from the 5th of december 2013 where I asked Hillary rather tentatively what Cromwell might have been thinking about on his journey back from Yorkshire to London, which is where the play of Wolf Hall begins. We, the first scene of the play is Cromwell having ridden from Yorkshire to Wolsey's Palace to report on 
why the monks in the north were being so difficult. So he comes in kind of rain spattered with his saddlebag still over his so over his shoulders, cold, wet, hungry, exhausted, and enters into these these you know wonderful sort of um, the palace of Wolsey with a roaring fire and wine and bread and everything, and sort of gets Wolsey has the debrief. So I said to Hillary, what might Cromwell have been thinking about on his way down and. Um, I got back a kind of five-page email, which is like the one of the early lost chapters of Wolf Hall. Um, the first line of which was Gerald, Hillary's husband, says he's probably inventing the M1, um, which I thought was spot on. Yep. Um, and she listed all the things that was going on at that time in the world, all the things that were going on in Cromwell's life, all the things that he may be thinking about, the larger global political landscape, the state of the horses, the quality of the rain, what he might have eaten, where his next meal might be coming from, the places along the journey that he would have to stay and change horses. I mean, there was such detail and such depth that I was I was completely blown away by it. And I thought, well, this is great. This is this is my channel. If I ever have any questions about this character, this is the channel. And kind of ever since we've had a a relationship of sharing thoughts and recollections and ideas about Cromwell. It was largely by email at that time and had been for it continued to be for a few months after that, particularly during rehearsing the plays and playing the shows. There wasn't that much occasion for us to be actually physically in the same room together because Hillary lives in Devon, you know, I was based in Stratford, live in London. So thank goodness for email is all I can say. And um, because she's, she's just, a, she's such a wonderful writer as well as a wonderful speaker. The email, the quality of the writing in the emails I've received over the years has just been phenomenal. So much so that I've kind of kept them all so I can kind of go back and, and reread them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I first encountered Hillary and, um, we've really been in touch ever since. Fantastic. And would you be able to speak a little bit about the development of the script for, for this play? Um, yeah, and how of it differed slightly from, from Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, the collaboration we have now as writers, as co-authors of the play, mm. of The Moon and the Light, really began, again, in, in the sort of, rehearsal stages of Stratford on Avon, I'd say in 2013, 14, where we'd exchange ideas. Um, and the more we got into the run of the plays, the more I performed, um, it seemed that the more I was able to relax into the role and understand the role more. And once you kind of reach that state of having played the play a few times, you begin to stop worrying about doing the play. And if you if you are willing, you allow yourself to have thoughts, kind of in the character of Thomas Cromwell. You begin to sort of imagine memories and you imagine scenarios that are happening off stage as well as on stage. And your imagination is sort of active in a new way. Um, and often during the run of the play, particularly when we performed it, perform, performed them both in the West End, in, in uh, the Aldwych Theatre in London, I'd have these thoughts during scenes, a particularly good scene to have sort of Cromwell thoughts in was when King Henry was signing the death warrants of his four friends, uh, which of course was in Bring Up the Bodies. And that there'd be quite a while where I'd be standing on stage behind the fantastic Nathaniel Park, who's playing Henry VIII, just watching him sign these things. And I, Cromwell, would be having these kind of thoughts and imaginings and these sort of memories started to form for him slash me. Um, and I'd often, after the show on the way home, I'd email Hillary with these thoughts, these recollections. Um, that one particular instance in that scene being you know, Cromwell was forcing Henry to do something that he really didn't want to do. It was a very, it was a great act of coercion. 
and an act of transference of responsibility because onto Henry because Cromwell it was Cromwell really that wanted these people to go to their deaths um, but he engineered it so that it went through Henry and convinced Henry that they had to go to their deaths and it's an incredible feat um, and I was wondering about Cromwell whether Cromwell in his youth had ever sort of passed the buck in mm -hmm. a big a sort of dodged blame uh, there's always the legendary story about the about him killing a boy age 15, which was is what caused him to to leave London. Um, but I imagined other sort of things of things he may have done that he he may have pointed the finger at someone else. Um, and that kind of discussion grew and continued, and it's kind of ended up in the mirror and the light with the recollection about the boy. In the kitchens, uh, Cromwell had done some, something had happened. I can't recall what it is. Someone had stolen some food or something. And it was Cromwell. But he said, no, it wasn't me. It was him. And him got a beating for it. Uh, and after the beating, the cook in the kitchens turned to the young Cromwell and said, you. It was you, wasn't it? I know it was you. And um, that kind of... That moment came up, came about because of the correspondence Harry and I had had, and there were other instances as well. And I guess I bring that up to describe our first sort of collaboration as writers. I'm not claiming authorship of The Mirror and the Light, not in any way whatsoever. <laughs> but it is it's interesting how our how my recollections fed into Hillary's imagination, which ended up in the third novel and there are you know three or four other instances of that occurring in the novel um she drew great inspiration from watching the plays whilst creating the mirror in the light often there are there are very sort of minor characters in the book who have names the names of the actors who are in the shows um <laughs> my younger brother is named in the book at one point um it's it's fun reading the mirror in the light mm. just to kind of spot your spot the people you know in a way um so from that work we would <clears throat> meet often when the play was transferring from one theater to another like when it came from stratford on avon to the west end and then when we transferred from the west end to broadway in 2015 the play had to go through a bit of a change in order to adapt it for the particular stage we may have had new thoughts in the playing of things this scene doesn't particularly work there or that scene could be better there or, you know it it went it went a kind of it, it experienced a kind of overhaul each time we restaged it and at each point Hillary and I would gather together and do some work on it do some kind of I guess you could call it surgery on the play mm. and um I loved those sessions, those meetings, and I think Hillary enjoyed them too. So when it came to the dramatization of the third book, um, which instant, interestingly enough, Hillary wrote with a view to the stage play already in place. It was as if she wasn't just writing the novel, she was writing the novel and the play sort of over here at the same time. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, when it came to dramatizing the pl the novel for the stage, Hillary emailed me and said, I sort of fancy having a go at it myself, but I, I don't feel quite able to fully. <clears throat> Do you know of any writers that might want to have a go with me, working with me on it? And I said, I'd have a think. So I had a think and I thought, God, I'd really love to <laughs> have a go. <laughs> Um, because <clears throat> I enjoyed I enjoyed working with her so much on the other two in a very small way. Um, and so I said, well, would you consider me as a co-writer? And she wrote back and said, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, why didn't I think of that? Yes, if you're up for it. And I went, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and um, it kind of went from there, really. Um, that process began gosh a year and a half ago I think it was nearly two years ago actually nearly two years ago that conversation happened um, 
and we've been working on it ever since. We, we've been working on it today. You know, it's still going on, even though we're we are three days away from technical rehearsals for the show. We're still um, reworking things, changing things as they come up in rehearsal. So it's um, it's 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 a it's a really wonderful um, new avenue for me as a sort of creative artist. I've never really written before, um, and I've really enjoyed it. I've loved every minute of it. It sounds like a spectacular process and just amazing to hear how live it is. Like it, it feels like yeah. the play is kind of live entity that's moving between you and Hillary and the rest of the cast all the time. Yes, exactly, all the time, yeah. A lot of my work on Hillary's work is thinking about this idea of spectrality and haunting and just listening to your process and listening to kind of these memories that are yours and aren't yours and are also Hillary's and not Hillary's. Mm. And it's such a fascinating kind of image of how that process works um, it's, yeah yeah it, it really is i mean it's very much <clears throat> i mean hillary's often said she's when she's writing scenes between characters she'll she'll just sort of sit back and listen to them talk rather uh, in a in a in a in a sort of a clairvoyant sense if you know what i mean um and often when we were writing scenes from the plays it, it was a similar process. You'd, you'd kind of, you'd establish where you were in the scene. You'd establish who was in the scene. You'd sort of get an idea of what you, what the point of that scene is, what you hope to achieve by an audience witnessing that scene. And then sometimes you just kind of sit back and close your eyes and just let them talk. <laughs> and you'd often be find yourself sort of transcribing what you hear rather than generating the speech yourself as in a way you know and, and, and I, I i find that i find that fascinating particularly in the field of historical novels the kind of the the, the meeting of historical fact i guess you could call it and imagination and where how what happens when those two entities mix and blend and i it, you know on a good day you get three novels like wolf Hall, bring up the bodies and the mirror and the light you know and uh i, I but for I, a day I, like that <laughs> yeah yeah i it, it i've i've had the joy of witnessing hillary in locations such as Windsor Castle, you know, St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, um, Lambeth Palace, Wolf Hall itself, we visited a number of times. Uh, and it's like, it's like watching a diviner walk around. You can, you can almost sort of feel when she's receiving stuff. <laughs> as it were absolutely i had the privilege when i was at the huntington looking at hillary's archive to find um some of her notes and on the top um she'd written um these notes written at brick place um which was obviously rafe sadler's yeah. house, national trust property um, yeah yeah and was kind of was so clearly written in response to being in that place sharing that place with with the historical yeah. dead yeah yeah, I think location, especially for me as well, um, being in places that Cromwell had either visited or that was were related to his story was, for me, the best kind of research mm. for the character. People often read, 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 read reams and reams and reams of stuff. I didn't for this, to be honest. Okay. I read the novels, and that was my background research. <laughs> That's all I needed, because... It was tremendous factually, and it was tremendous psychologically. Um, I know Dermot McCulloch has written a superb, definitive biography of Thomas Cromwell, which I've yet to read, because I, I, I don't feel I have... Forgive me, Dermot, if you watch this. I, I don't feel I have the need to read that, because mm -hmm. what, I'm, what my job is is to personify Hillary's version of Thomas Cromwell's version of events in the mid 16th century. Um, so for me, my research really led me to visiting places, uh, often with Hillary, 
often with my younger brother, George Miles, who's a photographer. Uh, and George and I would walk around Putney Heath, take boats along the Thames, go to the city, Blackfriars, and take photographs of seemingly strange stuff, but stuff that we were just drawn to. Uh, and that was one of the earliest kind of research sessions for me in terms of researching Thomas Cromwell. And funnily enough, this series of pictures that George and I took, we, we ended up showing them to Hillary in Stratford in early 2014, as, just as a kind of look at what we've been doing, <laughs> uh, you know, in the world of Thomas Cromwell. And she, she was absolutely, she really took to them and was amazed by them. And it, it, it this goes back to what we were talking about, the sort of clairvoyant nature of Hillary's work, I think. Um, I think she saw in what George and I were doing was a similar act of absorption of seemingly mundane scenarios, dusty old corners, you know, muddy riverbanks, strange buildings in the city that people walk by and don't even look at, you know. But there was something about these places that we were photographing. We very rarely photograph people, it's more places, that Hillary, I think, I think she, there was some reaction to them which was, which was resonant with her own process. Um, she's since uh, written about them and written about my brother's process and uh, She's been quoted as saying, George Miles seems to have been photographing my unconscious for the last five years <laughs> without what knowing it. What a wonderful it. compliment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, this is culminating in another project, which should, be, which should be published next year, which is a book of these photographs that George and I took with writings by Hillary, that it, either they're being either excerpts from the three novels or <laughs> original writing on each picture. Anyway, that's a kind of... <clears throat> that's a that's a tangent. No, it's wonderful. It's that thing, but um, it's um, that um, absorption of atmosphere was very important for me in my in my work. I wonder if you've come up and visited our beautiful cathedral at Worcester, because obviously Henry VIII's older brother Arthur is is buried up here. Um, yeah, I did some work on. The relationship between the cathedral and the books and Arthur's tomb in the book and Arthur's tomb in the cathedral and Arthur is this unknowable unfindable figure literally and kind of historically um oh. yeah that just really really chimed chimed with the work that I've been doing as well yeah. we've been talking a lot about materiality and I, I guess some of the questions I've been thinking about in terms of your work on the plays and and your kind of imagination of Cromwell you're bringing him to life are around this idea of materiality, especially in Wolf Hall. One of the joys of the book is that we are in Cromwell's head. We see the world through his eyes. But then once he's on stage, we need to see him. We need to see the man, the kind of embodied um, quality. Mm. And I, in early conversations with you, I talked about Wolsey's wonderful description of Cromwell as one of those square-shaped fighting dogs that low men tow about on ropes. Um, yeah. So we experience his physicality through others, but, but that's not the principal way in which we, we get to know Thomas. Could you tell me a little bit about how you achieve that kind of embodiment, what, it, what it's like to kind of be in Cromwell's body, how you kind of um, bring him to life in front of our eyes rather than just in our heads? Yes, it's it's it's... It's it's a really interesting facet of bringing someone to life is 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 physicality, um, and also finding sort of finding the right metaphor as well to describe it. It often helps. Um, he's obviously a very physically fit man, very mentally agile man as well. Um, he spent his life on the road. He was a soldier, he was a mercenary. Uh, spent a lot of time on horseback. And, that, you know, the, the, the just the act of being alive and being working as a man like Cromwell involved a huge amount of physical exertion. Um, so I think he had a, he had a toughness about him and a sort of strength and a, a sort of visceral quality that he I think he may have inherited genetically as well from mm. his father, from that that the, the world of the smith and the blacksmith, and having grown up seeing 
people physically at work all day. Um, you know, he's not from a kind of clerical or a scholarly background. He's from a he's from a working class background. So he was around working people his whole his whole life. And then, as I said, became a soldier in his kind of mid-teens to his early 20s, which, again, was an incredibly physically demanding and mentally demanding life. Um, so he has great strength. He's very fit. He has great capacity. He has great potential energy. There's a kind of a, there's a very deep well of potential energy, I think, in Cromwell. And one of his great skills is his economy and the use of that energy. He's very good at being on standby, as it were, uh, just running on in a steady low gear. And should need, should he need to, he can accelerate from naught to sixty in five seconds, you know, or he can draw a knife and have a have a blade in someone's leg in less than a second. You know, he it, it's it, he is he contains a lot, Cromwell, I would say. Uh, in terms of his, his, the sort of engine of him, I found the best image I could come up with was a, like a very, I remember saying this to Hillary, he's like a very well built coal fire. Mm. He has, it's like a sort of forge. Again, it's going back to the forge. It's, he's like a well made fire, hot, glowing, no, not kind of flames flying around everywhere, but mm. just has a, has, if he was a sort of coal fire, you'd look at him and you'd go, that fire's going to last all night. Mm -hmm. It's been built on and built on and built on, and there's a huge sort of store of energy. And it's just a slow, strong, steady release of energy. And I think that's what that's what Cromwell is, and that's what I often kind of fall back on um, when when you try to sort of cut down to the essence of a character you know there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of cerebral conversations about stuff in mm -hmm. theater as there is in literature as there is in scholarship but trying to find a char character's essence is always really important for me trying to find a kind of central motor and often that image comes to mind of a sort of large forge fire or a or a big sort of fire you see in those massive Tudor fireplaces at Hampton Court. Um, that that for me, if I start there, then then the rest seems to be built on solid ground, as it were. Um, yeah, he 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 he's a fabulous contrast of high intellect, incredible mental agility, great diplomacy and bonhomie. But such a threatening physical presence when he wants to be as well. He's the kind of man that could clear a room in a pub by just walking in. Yeah. Um, so to have all that in one person is 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 is, is just fabulous, really. It's remarkable, and I think that image is is exactly right. That kind of energy, that kind of slow vibration of potential threat, or just potential. I think that word you used is absolutely yeah. on that kind of what might happen now, what could happen now. And that sense that Cromwell is, at least in the first two books, completely in control. Yeah. That energy, yeah. completely in control. I think there's a moment in the first book where he talks about kind of an axe leaning up against a tree with the force of the blow it could strike still kind of vibrating through the handle. And that's precisely. It. Yeah, precisely that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. staying on this idea of Cromwell's kind of material world, but kind of moving away from, from his embodiment, his, his physicality. One of the things that I know Hillary's talked about a lot um, is the kind of, is the materiality of the Tudor world um, and how different that might feel to our own contemporary world. Um, and I'm thinking also in terms of the um, Kaminsky TV adaptation and some of the responses to that of, it's too dark, I can't see anything because they had only yeah. used candles, natural light. And that sense of wanting people to engage with, we literally see things differently in this period of history. Our senses yeah. are differently kind of orchestrated. Yeah. And obviously when you're on stage, you're dealing with this beautifully designed, but very specific theatrical environment, costuming and everything that goes into that. And again, with Hillary's writing, you've got this real, for me, this real preoccupation with textiles and texture 
and how she clothed her characters. Mm. How did you approach that as a team on the um, in the adaptations that finding this Tudor materiality in a space that actually needs to be very sparse and very expressive and a con on a contemporary kind of theatrical stage? Yeah, it was a really interesting process. It, it began with um, it began with me freaking out actually, if I'm honest, because. Uh, <laughs> I came to rehearsals immersed in the books. And as you say, quite rightly, Lucy, the, you, the description of the tapestries in the rooms, the furniture, the food that's being offered, the, the wine, the smell of the, of the, of the, of the, of the wall, the, the detail, the abundance of stuff in those interiors in Wolf Hall is just fabulous. So we, I got into rehearsals, and you know, we started rehearsing the scenes. And I was saying, "Well, we need, we need, we need two chairs here at least, and we need like, where's where are the where are the jugs for the wine? Where's where's the cups? Where are the plates? Where's the table? Mm -hmm. You know, this, we're eating here. We need all this stuff. Surely we're going to have, you know, a tapestry here and a kind of you know chandelier there, aren't we? I mean, that's the that's Wolf Hall, isn't it? However." Jeremy Herring, our director, was staged it so brilliantly and so economically, and Christopher Oram, my designer, was in in, in it, totally in, in in sync with that. What we had to do in order to generate an exciting two and a half hours in the theatre was try and have the ability to switch from indoors to outdoors within a second, from Henry's most private chamber to the fields of Stoke Newington in the blink of an eye, in the switch of a, a switch of a light. So the less stuff we had on stage, the better. So we couldn't have the silver plates, the hanging tapestries that I thought we were obviously going to have. So it was quite hard for me, if I'm honest, early on to go, OK, right, we've just got to imagine all this stuff, right? We've got to, mm. we've got to actually act as if it's there. Because all we had in Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies and, you know, largely in The Mirror and the Light is this incredible set, the backdrop of this fabulous kind of cross. Occasionally there'd be a chair. That's it. And it was kind of done with lighting in, 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 in Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies. It was Paulie Constable and David Plater who lit it so fantastically. Um, and we have a new lighting designer on this and, and, and with... Um, with uh, Nick Powell, our sound designer, um, it was it, it, it's, it's down to those elements, and mm. uh, we had to just jettison any expectation of um, basically furniture and props. Um, so one had to imagine, mm. and particularly in changing from one scene to another. What was incredibly helpful was drawing resources from the novels uh, in terms of the weather. If you're outside, what was the weather doing? If you're inside, what kind of room was it? What did the room smell like? What time of year is it? What time of day is it? Well, all that kind of stuff is, is in the novels. So you had to generate the exterior from your interior imagination um, and that uh, that very soon became a joy to do. And uh, it's now become our kind of language, our kind of theatrical language is, is to you know, be walking up stage and then you turn and you're in a new space. Um, so the materiality of the, of the, of the novels was, was hard to let go of, but it's sort of, it, it's come back in the stage versions in, 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 in a new way, it's still, it's still present, but it's actually not visible, as it were. It's not tangible, but it is in our imaginations. And hopefully, as an audience, you will be able to believe that we are in a certain space just by the way it's lit, by the way it sounds, and by the way our bodies behave in that space. Just from what you were saying, it sounds like a really fascinating process of translation, whereby the world isn't materially present for the audience but it's coming kind of from the inside of the actor out you are kind yeah, of projecting it, it in the world yeah, yeah and i guess in collaboration great... with the audience too 
Well, this is just what I was going to go on to say. It, it, it's never that job is never really done until the audience accepts it and believes it. And one of the great unique things about theatre is this willingness on the audience to believe. You know, the suspension of disbelief. It's often called, but it's a it's a sort of collective delusion, which is happily <laughs> done, hopefully, uh, and it starts with whatever the behavior is on stage whatever whatever the audience is witnessing if they if they see four actors and kind of kind of what looks like leaves in shadow and maybe very subtle bird song going on throughout the theater they'll believe they're in the green fields of Stoke Newington or they will they'll believe they're you know that wherever they are it's and uh it's thrilling when it works it really is it's kind of more enjoyable on a bare stage than it would be on a fully sort of kitted out set. That's the joy of of, of theatre, really. I mean, mm. television and film is a is a is a different thing. It's a different discipline, and often the joy of that is the actual detail, the microscopic detail of of real material things. Uh, but on a stage, it often works better not to have all that because it kind of it can get in the way, especially when you're trying to change location in a split second. Absolutely. And I wonder as well if it if it sets the stage to use a hackneyed metaphor, it sets the stage for thinking the past differently. If we kind of yeah. there's a risk, isn't it, if we fall back on the tapestry, the roaring fire, the obligatory shaggy wolfhound yeah, yeah. in uh, exactly. England, we can't think about it differently. Whereas yeah. the stage allows us that space. It allows you to do that, and a stage and the, the 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 stage versions we have compel an audience just to see just to see the people mm. and what they are reacting to, what their emotional response is to what's happening around them, and the sort of veneer of Tudorness, as it were, is gone, which is which is essential, I think, if you want to understand these people, and. One of the curious kind of strokes of genius about Hillary's work is it is so detailed. It is so particularly Tudor in that historically it's it's like a it's it's super HD. And yet <clears throat> the most compelling thing about the novels for me is is the human beings in it and their experience of it and their what happens to them emotionally. It's you are seeing you're just seeing people reacting to events. It happens to be in Tudor England, and it happens to, you know, but it, but the, I think that's one of the reasons why these books are so successful. Is is you see Thomas Cromwell as a as a as a person, yeah, reacting to stuff, making stuff up, trying to survive. You don't. They're not simply. It's not, you're not witnessing historical events. It's like you read them and it's like the present. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And, um, it's something that Hillary's talked about incredibly compellingly is that these people were just making the best decisions that they could make in the circumstance at the time. Yeah. They don't know what's coming. And I think it's yeah. what makes the final book in the trilogy so powerful and so emotionally kind of raw. For me anyway, in my reading was that this awful realisation of I've managed to forget what's coming until it happens to Thomas Cromwell. Yes. And you are shocked yes. by it. You are shocked, <laughs> even though this is it was always going to happen. And you yeah. knew that that was the deal when you sat down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That ability yeah. to seriously enough, when when you when you are when you receive the shock of, oh my goodness, I'd forgotten that this is going to yeah. happen. I find myself then just kind of lying for it to happen because I couldn't stand the time from the realization of the end to the end. I was like going, oh, yeah. Can we just kill him now? Because it's just, yeah, it's just not it's too cruel. Too um, yeah, yeah. It, and, but curiously enough, the mirror and the light is about when you read it, you sort of forget what's going to happen. But one of the great things that I love about the mirror and the light is is this investigation of what is the What's the true narrative of the past? There's a mm -hmm. lot of reflection in the mirror of the light, a lot of a lot of retrospection on Cromwell's part and how he he looks back on his life and 
says, did that really happen? Or mm. was that how it was? And all through the novel, you have these wonderful characters turning up, going, saying to Cromwell, no, 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 that didn't happen the way you say it did. Mm. Or you're not the person you think you are. Or you're not the person that everyone else thinks you are. I think you are this version of yourself, which you haven't quite come to terms with. And it's it's wonderful to to see a character who you think you know and you you believe to be so sure of himself suddenly be challenged by these 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 encounters which cause him to you know really take stock of his life and think back and and re-examine who he thought he was absolutely i think it's that reflection is really helpful particularly in terms of thinking about the current conversation around history there's a lot of discussion isn't there at the moment about rewriting history yeah you can't take that statue down we're rewriting history and that idea that actually when those kinds of statements are produced it it neglects the notion that history is narrative it's the narrative that's kind of been able to come to the fore it's the voice that was perhaps loudest perhaps yes privileged at this moment and i think hillary's grasp of that is really profound and the moments that fall out of the historical record and identifying these the gaps and the ghosts in the historical record yeah. and i think Cromwell does that for himself in his personal history as you so beautifully kind of illustrated yeah yeah i i, I think he does i think you're right about history certainly now i mean when, I, i'm just thinking about when i was when i when i was taught history at school mm. history was Right. He, now you are going to receive the version of the British Empire. This is how it was. This is what happened. And this is why it happened. You know, the Industrial Revolution. This is what happened. This is this, you know, and you re, you didn't kind of question it. You just kind of absorbed these these facts and you went, OK, well, that's what happened. What's next? But now, and I think it's rightly so. And I think Hillary's contributed to this. History is now, if you're willing to think about it, it's it's a subjective um, thing. It's written, you forget, it's actually written by people who have a slight agenda. Yeah. Or it's written by people who, as you say, were the beneficiaries or the victors in a particular revolution, struggle, you name, you know, it, it 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 isn't. When you read an historical account of something, and I know Hillary said this, you always ask, have to ask yourself, who has written this, and why do they want you to read it like this? Um, and yes, the Mirror and the Light particularly investigates this. I think history, myth, identity. Who has the authoritative word on that? Who has the last word on that? And why is the version that you think is the version, the version? And what are the other versions? And who hasn't been heard throughout history? Why is that event never talked about? Why is, you know, why is only half of Churchill's life talked about? Mm. Um, and I think I think it's really fantastic what's happening these days. I, I, I really do. I think it'll take a long time for things to um, to come to a sort of peaceful state in terms of you know what what history is is the right history. But then is is there ever a, a right history? Precisely. There can't, surely there can't be because it, because anything that's happened in the past is seen through people in the present and they, they perceive it in a way that is beneficial to, to them. They It's a subjective medium. That's what's often forgotten, I think. 100%. History is textual. All we have is the text. I'm, I'm reminded a little bit of um, Gregory's response to, I think he's reading The Golden Legend. and He says something along the lines of, some of these stories are true and some of these stories are not, but they're all good stories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that's, that's quite, um, yeah. quite apt. Um, kind of in, in relation to that, you're an actor who in your career has taken on roles 
whereby a historical figure, a real person, has been fictionalised. Um, mm. Thinking about your your performance in The Crown, as well as your performances as Thomas Cromwell, um, is there a particular set of considerations or challenges involved in terms of performing a role which is based on a real person who has has existed? Um, I know Hillary has spoken in her um, kind of commentary on on her Tudor novels, but her his, historical novels more generally about mm-hmm. the ethics of that. She she spoke really beautifully when I was speaking with her during my doctoral research about um, knowing that the Spaniel Keeper was called Humphrey. And so you call the Spaniel Keeper in your novel Humphrey and mm, mm, said something along yeah. the lines of, like, I consider that as an act of reverence. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think, was just wondering if yeah. you could speak to that a little bit. I think it's a really fascinating... Um, I think there is. I think ethics is a very good word. Reverence is good too. Yeah, I mean the the sort of two the two most particular examples of of I guess what I've done is is Peter Townsend in The Crown and and John Profumo in The Trial of Christine Keeler, um, both of which are pretty contemporary characters, both of whom have surviving family, um, and it always. It, it, I, I, I do feel sort of beholden to honour the memory in a way. I don't mean my performances are eulogies of those people or apologies for those people or celebrations of those people or anything. You just, you just have to try to go beyond showing people what they think they know those people to be and the only way I think you can do that is to try and truly understand them or try to it's a great act of empathy I think playing any character but I think I think empathy comes to the fore a lot when you're playing people who are actually have who have actually lived Um, you need to understand them and show them in all their in as much with as broad a sort of bandwidth as possible of 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 humanity you know you can <clears throat> you know for example peter townsend was sort of the great kind of victim of 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 the relationship between him and princess margaret you know he was he was the poor chap hard done by um, and he was, of course, but he was also quite tenacious and quite an ambitious man and, mm. and, and loved loved danger. There's a wonderful passage in, a, in his, one of his autobiographies where he describes walking, I think he was walk, walking to school as a boy, <clears throat> and he crossed a bridge, crossed a river over a bridge, and he'd always stop at the bridge and look over and see this torrent just racing underneath him. And he was, he was transfixed by it. He was transfixed by the danger of that. How, how much sort of peril was involved in that experience. And it excited him. And he said <clears throat> he'd always been drawn to danger. Uh, you know, he, he was, the, I think it was the first fighter pilot in World War II to bring down a, a German warplane. You know, he, was a, he, was, he flew in the Battle of Britain. He... <clears throat> He was a very brave man, you know. Mm. Anyone who fought in something like that is, of course, incredibly brave. But he courted danger and was drawn to dangerous situations. And that, I think, may have been one of the reasons that led him to pursue the the, the relationship with, with Margaret, I imagine. You know, so it it's... You have to... Um, understand these people and you have to show them in a very broad sense and again with 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 John Profumo you know he, you think he's a kind of womanizing you know lechy old politician and yeah you could argue yes he was but you have to kind of understand what 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 drives someone to be like that what are their needs what are their what are their what are their 
what are the kind of more personable qualities about them? What's lacking in their life that causes them to, to chase after that kind of thing? Um, I guess what I'm saying is all of this is th there are ethics involved in that you have to honour these people mm. their memory. You have to tell their lives not just as the people that people think them to be, if you know what I mean. Does any of this make sense? I'm not sure 100%. if it does. hundred percent. No, it does. It does. I think it reminds me, again, something that Hilary speaks about, and or I'm, I mean, I'm paraphrasing horribly because I do not have her eloquence, but this, this ability to say, what is this? And what else is it? And what yeah, else? Exactly. That simultaneity, I think, is, is so important to, to be able to see all of those things at once. Exactly, uh, exactly. Um, with, with Cromwell, it was kind of, it's kind of slightly different because, as I said, as I said a while ago, it's this is this is Hillary's Cromwell. This is Hillary telling Cromwell, telling Cromwell's story about himself. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. it's a, the whole thing is an imaginative act. He was a real person, and he did exist. And a lot of things that happened in the books are what happened, of course. Um, so the whole the whole sort of Wolf Hall trilogy is a is a is a great imaginative act within a historical context. However, you do still have to play a man who lived. And there is still even now, eight years on in me, a a a, a need to honor that man's memory. You know, because these these are actual people who lived, and in a way, by writing these books, by doing these plays, you it depends to what degree you you sort of, sort of subscribe to this mindset, but you invoke these people. Yeah. Um, I remember Hillary saying when she one of the early previews of uh, Bring Up the Bodies, there's a scene where Cromwell is interrogating Charles Breton. And he says to Charles, do you recall a man, a certain man called John App Ayton? And Cromwell describes John App Ayton's story at the hands of William Breton. And Hillary said, I remember hearing this story, hearing his name on stage, and it was as if I, as if John App Ayton had been heard for the first time in hundreds of years. And it was as if he'd kind of stood up and suddenly this person was being witnessed by people 500 years on and his memory was being honored it was it was it was a lovely thing to hear and i think in all the characters in these plays they are you forget they are they were living people and if you are willing to believe these such things the ghosts of these people are here we performed, I think it was the first performance of Bring Up the Bodies in, at the Old Witch in the West End on the anniversary of the death of the four, the execution of the four lords. And here we met that. And a kind of shiver went down all our spines. And that was literally half a mile down the river that that took place. Um, I forget how many hundreds of years ago it was. To the day, and here we were reenacting that very thing. Half an hour's walk from Tower Hill. Um, quite remarkable. So there often there are, there are these very tangible mm. links between now and then. And uh, and Hillary's work, I think, has, has sort of repaved those roads to yeah. the past. And Absolutely, has, and has allowed those people to live again in such a wonderful way. I hope they're happy. I hope to, I was wonder what Thomas Cromwell would think if he'd come to see the place. I feel like he'd have found a way to let you know by now if he wasn't happy. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I remember. Recalled to Henry once we did a we did a preview of Wolf Hall in Stratford on Avon, and um, uh, we had a, a Q and A afterwards with the audience. And I remember writing to Hillary the next day saying, I think Walter was in the audience last night because there was one man <laughs> in the in the audience in the queue and after. We couldn't see his face right at the back and he was just sort of, no, nah, I didn't like it. I thought it was boring. <laughs> I was confused. I didn't understand it. 
I thought was the point of this. You know, it was really, it was so, so I thought, oh my God, we've woken Walter and he's not I happy. mean, to be fair, the RSC is next to a very excellent pub, so Walter would have been very happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we've probably got time for one more question, if that's okay. okay. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to kind of, I guess, widen, widen our focus a little bit because the mirror and the light is opening at a time when various manifestations of extremism, religious and political, are exerting really significant pressure globally. Um, and obviously religious extremism forms a huge thread that runs runs throughout these three novels. Yeah. Um, where <laughs> what this play is opening at a moment when the monarchy and what it means to be royal and what that signifies in British society is under really increasing pressure. Um, and also a time when kind of nationhood and our relationship in terms of the UK's relationship with Europe and the international community can seem at times more vexed and more fragile actually than ever. And if this is something that people ask a lot about historical fiction. What are, the, what are the parallels between this and this moment in history and our moment? But for you, what what are and the key resonances, if any, or or is this the wrong question to ask? Do we need to actually be thinking, no, what does this tell us about our past, actually, and not try to find maybe an well, easier, it, a glib yeah. parallel? Yeah, I think I think it's easy to draw parallels, and I know Hillary resists it, and I I can see why there are. I think there are similarities, but parallels may be pushing it too okay. far. Because our worlds are so different, the world now is so different to the world then. Um, and yet, yeah, I totally agree, Lucy. I mean, you know, you, you a major world religion is in flux. There are wars fought over it. Extremism is rife. You know, what is that? Is that now or is that is that then? It's both. Mm. Um, National identity, absolutely right. What is that? Being really hotly debated. The nature of royalty, the role of the royal family. It, it, it's, 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 it's all there. There are, there are many, many, many residences to this. I mean, even you know, Cromwell himself, a, a, a man of seemingly humble birth, rising to a position of great power. You know. There are people that do that now. There are people that would, you know, claim to be humbler than they are. Um, but I guess my answer is, yeah, there are many, many residences and you can, you can look at the mirror and the light and you can say to yourself, well, <laughs> what's new? What's changed? You know, what's, <laughs> it's still going on. Um, it's, it's, it's 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 odd. It's hard to explain. Um, maybe it, things are in flux all the time. I mean, it was. I mean, is there ever a time in history in the last since Wolf Hall was written, you know, since the story came about in the last five six hundred years, that there has actually ever been equilibrium? Everyone's agreed on something. Theology is settled. Ethics are static. Morals are kind of set. There has there ever been a time where anything is not in flux, and the people in power are just reacting to random events day by day, trying to make the best of things, with innumerable different personal agendas clashing every minute of the working day. Um, yeah, I guess it's always been going on. It has a, it has always been thus, but. Yeah, there are there are quite an alarming number of resonances now uh, flying around. Uh, particularly, I really like that phrase you just used. It's it's still happening, and that idea of to think of history as something that's sealed away, hermetically sealed, and it doesn't change, and it happened over there, and now it's done. Yeah, I think actually Manthel's Cromwell knows that that's not true. It's that's not that true. wonderful yeah. moment at the end of Wolf Hall where he talks, he has this kind of who will swear litany, this idea of swearing the oath to Henry um, about the kind of the succession. Mm. And he talks mm. about who will swear the kind of boggarts in the woods and the unburied infants in, under the hedges and this idea of 
oh, I, can't, I can't quite remember the, the quote exactly, but this idea of the ghosts of the past come and, and feed on the blood of the living and this idea mm. that it's all, all happening. It's not, there's no it's lovely all, kind of... <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's again going back to the start of of, of our of our talk. That's what I I think that's what I meant when when I said really I think I know more about what it means to be English now, and that my the the the, the legacy that I've inherited of living in this country, I, I I kind of understand more. It's it's still present. Those myths are still informing our present lives, um, and history isn't linear. Time isn't linear. There is not one straight line from 1530 to now. And, and that, I think, is, is often the great tragedy of historians and political commentators and of anyone. It's not, it's not linear. It's not a logical straight line. Things don't happen in straight lines. Things are circular. Things are still happening. Things exist now which are reactions to events from five minutes ago, 500 years ago. It's all kind of happening at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, it's, 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 uh, yeah, but the link between then and now uh, is very strong right now. And I think it's a great time to be, to be putting this play on. Okay, well, all that remains for me to do is to uh, wish you very good luck with the opening of the show and to thank you very much for spending some time with us this evening and sharing your fascinating insights into this process. Thank you. Thank it's you. been my great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy, for uh, staging what was a fantastic conversation. And I'm sure everybody in the audience learned uh, an immense amount both about Hillary and about the working process involved in the, the recent production. Hi, and welcome to the first session of today. I'll be moderating the session. Um, my name is Mokshada, and uh, I think we all did the introductions yesterday, so I'll move on. Uh, a brief introduction of our speakers. Our first speaker, Kevin Gallen, is a PhD candidate in English at Duke University. His research interests include global modernisms, the contemporary anglophone novel, Irish literature, literary cultures and genre and novel theory. Our second speaker, Dr. Eleanor Boyan, is a senior lecturer in English at Met Manchester Metropolitan University. Her areas of specialization are post-colonial literatures, critical theory, especially queer theory, post-structuralism, eco-criticism and feminism. Our third and last speaker for this session, Dr. Matthew Hart, is an Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. He specializes in 20th and 21st century English literatures with an emphasis on modernism, poetry, contemporary writing and literary theory. So uh, without further ado, uh, Kevin, over to you. Great, thank you. Let me just get this uh, screen share up. So uh, I had a little bit of a uh, sort of an introduction to the actual talk written up, and uh, I think I need to kind of toss some of it out of the window after that really wonderful uh, conversation with Ben Miles. Uh, I think I got a little scooped, but that's okay. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to say is uh, thank you, everyone, uh, to the Huntington, to Lucy and Eileen for organizing this, uh, to Steve and Ben for the logistics and the AV support, all those other things. Um, and also just like a really wonderful uh, day and a half so far of material. I'm looking forward to this panel and to the next panel as well. Um, I just a, sort of brief background on what I'm presenting today. It is a lot about theatricality and about uh, the role that the stage plays in Wolf Hall as a novel. So coming at it from sort of a different direction um, that uh, Ben Miles just uh, sort of guided us through. Um, this also comes from a larger argument uh, that is currently under revision at ELH, uh, which in turn comes from a chapter from my dissertation, which is really about uh, the intersection of uh, genre, specifically low genres, historical fiction, detective fiction, science fiction, and how it intersects with globalization. So I'm really coming at it from thinking about what does the historical novel do? What is the historical novel in the contemporary moment? Um, the first half of it really focuses on that. And the second half really focuses on Thomas Cromwell himself, which uh, I've tried to sort of split it up in the interest of time, um, but there's obviously a little bit of bleed over. It's awfully difficult to talk about Wolf Hall without talking 
about Thomas Cromwell. Um, I should also say that uh, I'm really excited to be sharing a Zoom panel uh, with Professor Hart. Um, some of the comments that I received on the article uh, just about two weeks ago pointed me to his really wonderful chapter on Wolf Hall and some of the work by Amitav Ghosh, which I have been working through uh, rather rapidly uh, and trying to integrate some of uh, the wonderful things that he has said about this novel, because I think there's going to be a lot of conceptual and um, thematic overlap. Um, so I'm really looking forward to um, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And you'll see some of the creakiness, I think, um, as we go through and where I'm trying to bring in all the different conversations we've already had so far. I'm thinking a lot about our first panel from yesterday about uh, interdisciplinarity as well. Um, so that's my little spiel at the top. So I guess we can get started. In modern parlance, we'd call Wolf Hall's Thomas Cromwell a fixer. In fact, Peggy said that, uh, called him such just yesterday. Cromwell knows the right people to talk to and when, how both home and abroad to get things done. Fluent in French and Spanish, English and Latin, with, collection, with connections in Antwerp and bank accounts in Venice, he never lives in a single reality, but in a shifting shadow mesh of diplomatic possibilities. For our perspective here in the 21st century, we think of him as English, but the quote, unknowable, the inscrutable, and probably indefeasible Master Cromwell moves through and beyond the country he calls home, turning the whims of monarchs into the fabrics of nations. This is a pretty standard reading of Cromwell. Importantly though, Cromwell does all this astride a stage festooned with historical detail and populated by recognizable personages. And so Wolf Hall demands we read the novel from our present moment as a thoroughly documented account of English, England's formation in the past. As Matthew Hart has pointed out, Wolf Hall is dedicated to the Huntington's own Mary Robertson and her thoughts on the Tudor Revolution inform the proceedings. The Magisterial Revolution, the Magisterial Religious Reformation of Tudor England here becomes inseparable from the political project of making the nation, whether we conceive of it as a project of a popular identification, a commonwealth of subjects, or a noble administrative entity. Cromwell, Hart argues, citing Robertson and G.R. Elton, was quote, central to this process as both an individual and as the head of the state as a ministerial household. The interrelationship with professional historians doesn't end there, of course. Dearman McCullough writes in the first line of his Thomas Cromwell, A Revolutionary Life. Cromwell's name has happily become more familiar in the last decade, thanks principally to Hilary Mantel's inspired novel series, beginning with Wolf Hall. But it is not just history, but a performance of history, historicity, pastness that informs how we think of Wolf Hall. McCullough claims in his monograph that his primary purpose is not to write a history of England in the early 16th century, but to place Thomas Cromwell on that stage. Many have, literally, considered the stage and screen adaptations by the Royal Shakespeare Company and the BBC, and all the really wonderful things that uh, Ben Miles just walked us through, that great conversation between him and Lucy. There's a lot of overlap. Obviously, this is a novel that adapts itself to the stage really readily, but I'm a literary scholar, and so I want to focus on the novel itself. And the novel itself, prior to adaptation, asks that we think of Cromwell and of itself in similar theatrical terms. Throughout its present tense narration, we as readers watch as Westminster looms in the background, ledgers are kept, plays are performed. Henry VIII drinks and blusters his way on and off stage. Anne and Mary weave tapestries, sew napkins, and negotiate the political stakes of their court and courtships. Thomas More pontificates. Cromwell machinates. Indebted to the robust theorizations by titans such as George Lukash, Frederick Jameson, and Perry Anderson, one common interpretation, one common understanding of the historical novel positions the genre as an origin point for the modern nation state, a primordial site of contingent history out of which a national historiography is assembled and turned into myth. As such, later critics have argued that the literary historical novel thusly encumbered by its close ties to the nation state has been rendered irrelevant in the period of globalization that has emerged since post-Cold War consensus. Symptomatic of this slide from the center of political signification, these same critics argue, is the genre's drift downward in prestige and towards the literary periphery. Where once the historical novel was a key component in imagining a collective national identity in this era of inter, intra, and supranational formations, the historical novel, it would seem, has become unserious, unliterary, characterized by elaborate historical decorations, 
more akin to the dollar store romance novel than the nation making projects of Scott and Balzac. But I argue the stage direction, stage decoration elements of the popular historical novel are precisely the elements that make the genre essential today. Historical chauvinism regarding popular or genre fiction be damned. Wolf Hall hyperbolizes these signifiers of history, of pastness, while presenting through a newly present Cromwell the realities of global interconnection that drive its plot and character motivations. As Antonio Gramsci helpfully reminds us, the broader genres of the popular novel and the popular historical novel specifically infuse an ideological political character into the cultural production and consumption of the people nation by means of, quote, educating and elaborating the intellect and moral awareness of said populations. I posit that it is the very pageantry of the historical novel, an effect all too often associated with the more popular, less literary forms of the genre that affords Wolf Hall a unique position. The popular novel, by dint of it being popular, holds a particular purchase on shaping a broader, more collective understanding of national culture. The popular historical novel has the capacity to intervene in how its readers understand national history. Wolf Hall does so by welcoming us into its theater. Wolf Hall posits English national history not merely as a mediated record, but specifically as a performed one. All of its trappings as a historical period drama, including in American editions, its ornate neoclassical frontispiece framed by margins that invoke Ivy Corinthian columns, its five page cast of characters and family trees at the beginning of the novel and the profusion of details within it set the stage. The same goes for the dual epigraphs, the first taken from Vitruvius invokes classical taxonomies of theater, and the second from a 1520 morality play by John Skelton doubles down on the theatrics of it all, painting the novel in broad allegorical terms. But these markers of period drama should also be understood as an implicit argument about the role this aesthetic of performance has in creating a national popular sense of history in the first place. Sometimes the staginess is obvious. The fruit of Cromwell's political victory over Wolseley Anne's wedding to Henry is itself realized quietly in a chapel at dawn, quote, almost in secret with no celebration, just a huddle of witnesses. But Anne's elevation to the Marquess of Pembroke beforehand and coronation afterwards are both, both pitched as theatrical tableau with garter knights standing watch, noble ladies of England flanking the new queen, Mary bringing a coronet on a cushion, red and purple velvets, black ermines and black hair, the train of a blue gown, war horses, trumpets, a te deum sung over all. There is no dearth of performances of state in this performance of history. There is also, of course, a literal play within the grander play in which the Colonel Wolseley is tortured by devils after failing to procure the king's annulment. Patch, the actor playing Wolsey, tells Cromwell, you should have stayed over there, there being Italy. Why you come to my country? Cromwell, of course, is not from Italy, but Patch might be excused for the mistake. More telling, though, is Patch's response when Cromwell looks at the sweating actor with pity after the show. How can you act this part, Cromwell asks. Patch's reply, I act what part I'm paid to act. And you? With this, Patch pinions Cromwell with the wisdom of the novel's chief fool. Cromwell is a state actor and a stage actor, both at once. But the performativity of the novel is a subtler thing than even these obvious examples of pageantry, which we can see in attending to a pair of much remarked upon syntactic features of the novel. Namely, its consistent deployment of closely controlled present tense and the sometimes frustrating choice to refer to Cromwell primarily as he throughout, rather than naming him in the fashion typical of third person omniscient narration. As Mantell herself has written of her experience writing of the novel in The Guardian, quote, these events were happening now in the present tense unfolding as I watched. He seemed to be occupying the same physical space as me with a slight ghostly overlap. Even as she talks about her own process of writing, Mantell figures the historical moment of Cromwell's era as an ongoing present where events from half a millennium ago are not being reported and inflected, but are rather occurring in the here and now. Both of these authorial choices, present tense, pronomial vagueness, are constitutive of how deeply ingrained performativity is to the project of the novel. They serve alongside the novel's investment in pageant, pageantry to interpolate its audience into a collective reimagining of England's historical past. We think of present in terms of time on some sort of continuum from past perfect to future, 
with the present shifting along with us as we go. But the present tense also insists on presence, a here we are, that is lost in the reported speech of past tense. Mantel's use of pronouns is a further reinforcement of this communal present in both time and space. She makes a perfectly serviceable argument that it wouldn't feel natural to address someone immediately by their name. Demonstrative pronouns need to be warped into adjectives, that man, or proper nouns, Thomas Cromwell, when their referent is standing right in front of you, literally or figuratively. But by forcing the readers of the novel to assume this immediate position by relying on he, it is as if we too are there, along with Mantell, or more appropriately the narrator, watching the events of English history unfold before us. Together, these two narrative choices force the past into the present and our present into the past. What emerges is a virtual narrative space which demands to be read as an embodied now, which in turn assumes a collective audience for the performance. By reframing the historical period of Cromwell's England in immediate terms, Mantell render, renders history itself tactile, mutable, and observable, not as reportage, but as something witnessed experientially in space. History itself becomes something that should be understood as collectively imagined in our present. Thus, the language of the novel is performative in the active sense described by J.L. Austin. The novel performs history, makes history happen through the creation of the shared space between itself and its audience. The performance then is of history itself rendered immediate and present for us, its readers. The drama is that of English national history and therefore of England. The stage is the profusion of detailed settings, the plays and tableau, the echoing buttresses of Westminster and Whitehall, the corpuscular dinginess of the larder all alike, and the actors perform in the present tense. There's a small scene relatively early on which neatly demonstrates how historical particulars, performative markers of oldness, and descriptive present tense attention to interpersonal bureaucratic statecraft ebb and flow into each other to form Mantel's distinctive style. At the end of the novel's first section, Visitation, Cromwell is attending the Cardinal Wolsey as he serves as the advance party for Henry's trip to Winchester College in 1541. As soon as they arrive, Cromwell meets with George Cavendish, Wolsey's usher, in the kitchens of the college. Throughout, sorry, throughout the encounter, there are vibrant descriptions of the raw material that surrounds them. Quote, the larders are impoverished and such supplies as they have show signs of ill keeping and plunder. There are weevils in the flour. There are mouse droppings where the pastry should be rolled. The battery de cuisine is an insult and the stock pot is mildewed. Nearly a full page is given over to an intense profusion of details that serve primarily to give the proceedings an air of immediacy, specificity, and historical weight. While these details are not historical in the documentary sense, they do evoke a robust sensorium that draws the reader into the imagined present of the events. There is at the same time what can only be described as an oldness to these descriptions, a sense that we are, what we are reading is a description of the past that is rendered in the material present. And yet the solidity of these material details stands in juxtaposition with the intense political machinations of the two men. It is in the same order that Cromwell and Cavendish, after cycling through potential successors to Wolsey as chancellor, settle provisionally on Thomas More, shaking hands on a bet over whether he will, he will accept or not. We know the rest. This conversation set amongst the dingy and beweevled kitchen will prove significant both to history and to the novel's plot. It is in this tiny conversation between Cromwell and Cavendish, seemingly undertaken in passing, that frames and shapes both the entire novel and English religious and secular history more broadly. We have here both Moore's appointment to chancellor and the misgivings expressed by these political actors adumbrating the eventual outright conflict between Moore and Henry. But by collapsing major moments in the historical record in a scene so stuffed full with what otherwise might seem to be the mere adornments of the past, Mantell gives her players room to perform statecraft against the backdrop of history. By locating the scene in the larder, Mantell, if you'll forgive me, is showing us how the sausage gets made. But that's because even the making of these mere decorations is essential. Details about the creation of details are rendered as politically laden. Some 200 pages before either of the dramatic tableau mentioned earlier, Cromwell visits Mary, Anne's sister, and Henry's erstwhile paramour and finds her at the work of sewing. He asks her what she is making. It is Anne's new coat of arms, she replies, on quote, her petticoats, her handkerchiefs, her cloths and her veils, 
She has garments that no one ever wore before, just so she can have her arms sewn on, not to mention the wall hangings, the table napkins. Here I'm thinking of our conversation yesterday uh, from Lucy about all the fabrics and the stitching that go into the amazing work that she produced, but also we see it here in the novel as labor traditionally coded as feminine being essential to the makings of the state, itself an important corrective to modes of historiography that happily and unconcernedly center hyper-masculine world historical figures, often men. Here, Mary's embroidery does just as much in codifying a political identity for Anne, and thus the political legitimacy of Henry and Anne's coming marriage, as Cromwell's own political machinations in the kitchen. But the raw materials she is sewing are all the makings of costumes, reinforcing the performative nature of statecraft. Mary's handiwork is, is a premonition of outright political battles to come, a reification of the Boleyn Norfolk faction of the court that will, with great fanfare, be destroyed in the mirror and the light. But to contemporary readers, the historical pageantry of petticoats, handkerchiefs, wall hangings, and table napkins both provide the Tudor era costume drama elements of the historical novel, while also crafting coherent markers of English national culture. The salient questions are not whether such historical de details are there to lend an air of verifiability or whether they are significantly assimilated into the plot. Rather, the presence of these details in a historical novel of the making of the English nation state indicate that the presence of these stage setting details is essential to the process of nation making in the first place. This performance of performance, details about the making of details, recenters readers on what other critics of the historical novel might discount. The popular historical novel situates itself as its own kind of performance. Particular adept iterations, of which Wolf Hall is one, blur the lines between writ written fiction and collective multi-sensory stage performance. In doing so, the mere decorations that might otherwise activate a simple neoconservative nostalgia for a truer, more accurate England are in fact necessary to bring readers into their own national past. Once there, Cromwell and all of his international multivalence can reshape what England was and what it might be. If there were any doubt of the convergence of the interpersonal, the historical, and the geopolitical in the novel, Cromwell's own ruminations after his conversation with Mary cast it aside. Cromwell immediately considers what this otherwise small conversation might mean for the makings of political reality moving forward. What he sees is that there is a world before, there's a world beyond this black world. There is a world of the possible. A world where Anne can be queen is a world where Cromwell can be Cromwell. He sees it, then he doesn't. The moment is fleeting. A world where Anne can be queen is a world where England is recognizable as a coherent nation with her sharing its throne. And a world where Cromwell can be Cromwell is a world that accepts and embraces the full incongruities of the myriad cultures and languages that Cromwell himself embodies. This is the world that Wolf Hall imagines in our present and what it provokes us to consider as having always been true in the past. But this is ultimately a novel, not a stage production. And so the script, the call sheet, stage direction, set schematics, the notes from the director and schedules from the production manager all come to us through the medium of prose. It is no surprise then that Mantel's Cromwell stage actor and state actor, the ultimate player of the game, reckons the power of writing. The novel closes just after the execution of Thomas More, Cromwell's most resolute opponent. Cromwell returns to work. He has, he has his sketch map across the page, Mantell writes the novel's final paragraphs, England in a drizzle of ink. His calendar, quote, quickly jotted, running down it, marks a series of meetings which he must rearrange. Maps, calendars, meetings, accounts. Cromwell writes them all down. Readers of the historical novel may be in search of something particular, an understanding of a nation's history at a moment in time, the dramatic flourishes of a period that are recognizable. But Cromwell and Wolf Hall does something different with those particulars. By using as its setting the historical moment of the T Tudor Reformation at the outset of the quote, ministerial household, that coincided with England's emergence as a global geopolitical power, Wolf Hall forces its readers from any nation to reckon with the stories they tell themselves about the category of the nation writ large. Rather than eschewing English national history at the risk of seeming nostalgically revanchist, the decorations of the past bring the novel's audience together as an audience in both space and time 
to participate in a new image of what England was and thus what England is. Wolf Hall, as a historical novel, more importantly, an immensely popular historical novel, revels in just these sort of details. The final mise-en-scene of the novel as the curtain falls shows us Cromwell, and by implication Mantell, pen in hand. The act of writing itself becomes enveloped in performance, and we watch as Cromwell ensures that this new image of England cannot, must not, be understood as having arisen in a vacuum. We leave the theater with a newfound appreciation that the nation, England and otherwise, has always been global and remains so today. The historical novel, with all its costumes and sets, shows us how. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was extremely insightful. Uh, without interrupting you with questions, I think we'll move on to our next speaker, Eleanor. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, this paper's taking a slightly different turn, but hopefully there are still some links with the previous paper. Thanks so much for that. Um, thanks also to Lucy and Eileen for organizing this session. So this paper um, is entitled The Sense of an Ending, reading Hilary Mantel's The Mirror and the Light and Ali Smith's Summer during a pandemic. You note I've snuck in another text um, alongside Mantel's Oeuvre, and I hope that there's going to be an obvious reason as the paper progresses, you'll see some reasons for that. Um, so the paper offers a discussion of the two novels, The Mirror and the Light and Summer, that conclude the Wolf Hall trilogy in the Seasons Quartet um, of Ali Smith and Hilary Mantel. Both were published in 2020, representing conclusions to a series of linked novels for both authors. Reflecting on the experience of reading these two novels sequentially in 2020 under lockdown conditions in the UK under a pandemic, um, I try to think about their shared preoccupation with endings. My title referencing, of course, Frank Hamode's 1967 work, The Sense of an Ending. So these are the last two novels published um, sequentially. March 2020, Mantel's The Mirror and the Light was the UK's number one book overall in sales for the third week in a row. Waterstones fiction buyer Bea Carvalho told The Guardian newspaper, our bestseller is Hilary Mantel. Those 900 pages aren't going to seem daunting anymore and it's doing really well. Mantel then was embraced um, by booksellers and by the reading population, um, arguably as part of the slower uh, period of time, the experience of time changing during the lockdown, part of that slow living that seems to have um, brought bread baking back to British kitchens. So Mantel's novel at least partially by some booksellers, was billed as a retreat from the moment, escape from the present, um, to distract you from the fact that many other parts of your life had changed. And indeed, um, the sense of that novel filling a large space of being a long read or being a dense read is also part of, of the sort of sense that 900 pages is a uh, pretty impressive uh, hobby for the summer. Ali Smith's novel, The Fourth of the Quartet, was supposed to be very much representing events from in the middle. It was supposed to speak to the present, set in real time and written in real time, an experiment in rapidly changing events entering the novel as fast as possible. So these two serials, suggest very different projects. And yet, of course, they turn up in sort of the literary reader's world at the same moment. So we have surprising similarities nonetheless between them. Smith comments um, in um, Summer on that odd peculiarity of telling a story that's so new um, that it's uh, 
an old story still in the middle of happening. That's a paradox. Whereas Mantel talks about um, attempting to see history from the inside as it's happening. When you're situated in history, you don't hear the great drum roll of fate, but the penny whistles and the banging of dustbin lids. That would seem to be something that brings them together, um, suggesting that they're both trying to do something quite similar. And of course, one of um, Mantel's projects is to write in the present tense, as many people have already mentioned. So whilst in many respects, there are some huge differences, Smith seeking to narrate the here and now and attempting to incorporate rapidly changing contemporary events into her narrative, taken by surprise by Brexit and then by the pandemic, and yet rising to those um, important events as they happen. Mantel visiting, revisiting a historical era, era to reanimate it. Smith, of course, known for her stunning experiments with form, Mantel for an eclectic range of novels in multiple genres, and then for her return to historical fiction. Yet some of the literary challenges for both authors are strikingly similar. Renata Broche argues that Mantel deploys the narrative techniques of high modernism. Um, blended with those of contemporary popular fiction. And Smith has frequently been claimed as a meta-modernist rather than a post-modernist. And there's probably a whole other paper in discussing their shared love of Muriel Spark. In the Wolf Hall trilogy, Mantel offers a revived and sophisticated metafictional historical form, acutely aware of its own role in continuing to make and remake history. While Smith sets herself the challenge, to write her seasonal novels in and off the present moment as closely as possible to current events, but in a radically deconstructed polyphonic way. And yet both of the novels is of course caught by the question of time. The sense of an ending, the novels of course themselves as uh, the final in two sets of um, series, so the work, the responsibility of the work that they have to do, and also the sense of how the texts both end literally. In the novel, says Forster, there's always a clock. And picking up from that commode in the sense of an ending also thinks about this clock going on. Tick is a humble genesis, tock, a feeble apocalypse, and TikTok is in any case not much of a plot. We need much larger ones and much more complicated ones if we persist in finding will suffice. What happens if the organization is much more complex than TikTok? Suppose for instance, that it is a thousand page novel, then it obviously will not lie within what is called our temporal horizon. You might've been anticipating this 900 page novel, or indeed um, Mantel's sense that she wanted to create a super novel out of the trilogy. Um, Commode, of course, in the sense of an ending, um, intervenes in our understanding of plot. All plotting presupposes and requires an end that will bestow upon the whole duration a meaning. The mirror and the light sets itself up as that ending that creates sense in the rest of the text. The title is taken, says Mantel, an interview with Eileen Pollard, from one of Cromwell's letters. The primary narrative covers the next four years. It tells a new story, but it mirrors what has gone before, and it sheds new light upon it. I would like each book to work separately in terms of structure, but also to work in an overarching way, as if it were one super novel. There'll be, I hope, images that carry the reader from book to book, but they will work almost subliminally. The glimpse is quick. Maybe it was an illusion. So here the mirror and the light as text turns into the mirror and the light of the trilogy. 
doing the work of reflecting on what is going on before and shedding new light on it. It's fascinating to hear of the accounts um, of the construction of this final novel in dialogue with the adaptation of the two previous texts into plays, this intersection. Similarly, in summer, there's a pressing sense of summer as the ending, but also um, an imagined or fantasized ending that must be made to mean but might perhaps be more elusive. How do we come to understand what time is, what we'll do with it, and what will it do with us? Summer is really an imagined end. We head for it instinctually, like it must mean something, says Smith of her final novel in the quartet. The seasons that she's um, written through, autumn um, being her opening text, take us into this final text, Summer, where some of the characters that have lived and had different um, connections with one another in the previous three, finally sort of thread together and become understood in the wider context. So that all four of the novels feature some um, common characters and there's a thread running through it, particularly of a very old 101 year old um, man whose memories of the past allow us a hundred year um, sense of time, despite the fact that the novel's being set in the present. The re reception of um, Summer, um, many critics noted a certain, not an elation with that ending, but a kind of somberness. There's a somberness to this volume that even Smith's characteristic compassion and brainy playfulness can't quite mitigate, says Helen McAlpin. Indeed, made me think of Jeanette Winterson's character in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, who as a child um, creates a, a small needlework for school, which is not approved of at all. The summer is ended and we're not yet saved. So interestingly, in terms of their links, um, this is the last slide that I'm going to do on their links because in the longer paper where we would have had um, 40 minutes, I would have spent a lot of time also on the Smith text. But in the interest of staying focused on Mantel for a shorter paper, I'm just going to do one more kind of comparative um, aspect before moving on to talk about um, Mantel in, in, in another way. There is a clear relation between seriality and repetition in both of the two series. Um, for Mantel, she was, as we've heard discussed in a number of places, quite resistant to the idea of um, the ways in which this could be seen as um, comparative to, or should be seen as echoing um, the present. And yet, she says of writing um, this novel, it was impossible not to feel the pressure of the present. I suddenly saw the pilgrimage of grace in a very sharp focus, the incoherent outbreak of populism, a pervasive, ill-defined discontent. For uh, Smith, writing the cyclical seasons, the first novel, Autumn, is often considered to be the first Brexit novel, um, completed, um, due to a, a requested extension on her part so that she could fit in the um, shocking um, result of the referendum that to her and to many was unexpected. Elsewhere, I argue that Smith's writing creates what we might call a Brexit season, one that creates a radical disorientation. Brexit season could be understood, understood as a kind of suspension of seasonality itself, marking, um, um, as a marker of predictable change. Instead, a series of deferrals, past ultimatums, repeated calls to action result in a kind of drag. Brexit is the never ending story of disorientation, disconnection and division. So that sense of um, the present pressing on Smith is very much part of her own agenda and very much her experiment in writing. Mantel, though, 
um, the writing seems to nonetheless feel something about the present. She says the analogy between Brexit and the Reformation for her is wrong. The real parallel is populism, a nation turned against itself. So specifically thinking about these books then as endings, I want to just turn in the last, I think I've got about five minutes left, um, in the last section of the paper, just to think about how the text ends, but also how Mantel in her description of the ways in which endings come in her texts shows us how difficult it is to locate the end. The end comes first in the middle and after, I argue. Mantel drafted the death of Cromwell before she has even finished Wolf Hall. She says in an interview in the New Statesman, the scene would have been quite a thing to face if I'd had to do that work at the end. This, of course, um, for the reader is a, a very interesting question as to how we're going to um, decide which element, is it the very last section that was, was drafted before? Um, so are we reading an, uh, an edited version of that final scene or has it um, been kept pristine to how the writing came out the first time? Um, in typical Mantel fashion, she says that she was overcome once at a supermarket. She also comments on this in the Ruth lectures extensively, which I'm sure everyone's aware of. You know the end, people say. So how do you maintain suspense? It's not a real problem. You succeed not because the fact, not despite the fact that your reader knows what will happen because of it. The writer of history is a walking anachronism, a displaced person using today's techniques to try and know things about yesterday that yesterday didn't know itself. Commenting on her um, adaptation of The Mirror and the Light, um, sorry, commenting on her writing of The Mirror and the Light, she says, She's still writing the third novel um, whilst adapting um, the first two. You can't even say the first two novels are finished because the writing and the reading of the third makes them live again. Flashbacks and reruns will make the reader question what she thought she understood the first time around. So the sense of the new book going on in the background made for a project, she says, that never came to rest. It was a tumult a ferment, or so I felt. I sat in the audience so many times and learned and understood what live theatre can be. So one of the ways in which I think Mantel's skill in dealing with the question of the reader knowing the end, or indeed the audience knowing the end in the theatre productions, is her staging of dread. Right at the end of um, The Mirror and the Light, um, Cromwell's now clear that he is about to die. And he's sitting, attempting to read Erasmus' Preparation Unto Death. Written only five, six years back under the patronage of Thomas Berlin, it tires his eyes. He would rather look at pictures. So Cromwell reads the words, we believe, from preparation unto death. Of all dreadful things, death is the most dreadful, save a certain philosopher. Although he reads dread right at the end of the text, the word dread occurs in various forms in 13 different places in the novel, as a verb, a noun, or an adjective, in modern and archaic form. But we see dread moving in multiple directions, both referencing um, actual events or more existentially in terms of a kind of crisis. For the sake of time, I won't be able to look at all the different dreads, but I've noted them all here for you in case you want to um, give yourself a similar quality of feeling reading. Um, the very first example is as good as any to talk about the ways in which dread moves from different uh, voices and positions. Usually Cromwell is present, but sometimes other people are dreading their own fate. Thomas Wyatt speaks to Cromwell in the tower of his father. 
Uh, when he is asked if he wants to contact him, he says, no, I dread his contempt. Of course, Henry is a figure who's already in an earlier um, part of his life been tortured um, for his um, beliefs. There's a move and a shift with the term dread as the text develops. It's used five times in part two to talk about firstly how the population is deluded um, and misled by the clergy. They make them dread the fire of purgatory. Um, one of my favorites, London dreads the North. The expression of dread on her face, referring to Jane's uh, conversations with Henry about his fear that he's murdered his brother. And then things about our dread sovereign, do you dread him in conversation with Cromwell? Gradually, as the text develops, it's Cromwell who speaks of dread. Cromwell is sick. He lives in dread. It's, it is coming inexorable as nightfall. And finally, in part six, Cromwell, under interrogation, is first accused of a dreadful presumption, his attempt, alleged attempt to um, marry Mary. Um, Cromwell dreads that the king will stop race visits. And finally, through every, uh, though every man dreads to know the hour of his death, the Christian dreads more a sudden end, such as his father met. But this dread is deeply linked, I think, to um, Mantel's obsession with the end, her dread of writing the end, so writing it first, um, and the sense in which the ending is constantly uh, rehearsing its um, arrival. Um, the future is coming back to haunt the present. But it's not something that's exclusively kept um, for the males. The other clear dread pattern that runs through the series as a whole, of course, is um, pregnancy and childbirth. So in this um, passage from the middle of the novel, reflecting on um, a depiction of um, Jane, um, Jane's lying in, um, the narrator says, what is a woman's life? Do not think because she's not a man, she does not fight. She knows she may not come out alive of that bloody chamber. Before her lying in, if she's prudent, she settles her affairs. If she dies, she'll be lamented and forgotten. If the child dies, she will be blamed. If she lives, she must hide her wounds. Fascinatingly, all that physicality and the dread is mediated through a discussion of uh, the Virgin Mary as a key figure for childbirth and of text. Um, the midwife plasters parchment against the skin of the domed belly or ties it to her wrist. The perspiring woman will sip water from a jug over which her friends have recited the litany of the saints and Margaret Beaufort's annotations to the great book of birth, of giving birth will be consulted. And then dread, the dread of um, one's own death or the death of the child and the, dread, and the dread of different kinds of blame attached to the event that um, is coming from the future. So just to finish up, I think that interesting sense of the event that comes not so much from the past, but as we know, according to Derrida's model of the spectral, is a kind of coming back. Um, these omens and foreshadowings and senses of unease um, produce the sense in the text of um, different forms of shock um, to the present moment. Yet um, the text is constantly um, alluding to the future that, that will be to come. Derrida warns saying the event is always somewhat problematic because the structure of saying is such that it comes after. And secondly, it always misses the singularity of the event. The coming of the other overwhelms me. 
I insist on the verticality of this coming because surprise can only come from on high. Horizontally, there's a horizon of expectation. So the coming of the inaugural event can only be greeted as a return, a coming back, a spectral revenance. And Mantel comments on this. Um, we don't stop going to see um, Romeo and Juliet because we know that the lovers die. We hold our knowledge like a present we can't give him. The reader is in two places at once. Only fiction can do this. Sorry, it's good. Thank you, Melanor. That was absolutely fascinating, especially the comparisons you made and uh, the talk about seriality and repetition. Um, really enjoyed it. Moving on to our last speaker, um, Matt. Okay, thank you, Mukshada. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Steve, Lucy, Eileen, everyone for putting the, the conference together. Thanks to the Huntingdon. I am uh, very disappointed that we're not doing this together in Los Angeles. Um, that would have been greatly pleasurable. Um, and it would have occasioned, uh, given me an opportunity to spend some time in Mantel's papers at the Huntingdon, which is very much on my radar or something to do in the future. Um, I'm gonna skip any kind of long introduction in part because as Kevin mentioned, um, both in his introduction and in the paper, there are some interesting consonances between his work and mine. Um, and hopefully his paper gives you all of the context that you would need to understand why I'm interested in the things that I'm interested in, in this talk. Um, my talk is Such a Person, the Historical Novel in Contemporary Space. The initial version of that title suggested that my paper was primarily going to be about the giant O'Brien, which we heard Eileen speak about very well yesterday, um, and a place of greater safety. Uh, in the end, as I'll explain along the way, um, it focuses a little bit more on a place of greater safety and the relationship between that and Wolf Hall. So I'll just get going. For a novel with a geographic concept in its title, Mantel's A Place of Greater Safety isn't that interested in setting. Mantel's title phrase comes up in her novel's long last section, which runs from August 1792 to the execution of Danton and Desmoulins in April 1794. The context is a conversation between Desmoulins and two unnamed soldiers who were guarding the National Convention, where partisan debate has given way to the trading of indictments for capital crimes. This is the period of the great tension between the partisans of the mountain, uh, the Jacobins and the partisans of the Girondist faction. And so when Camille first sees the soldiers, he assumes the worst. You've come to arrest me, he says. I suppose the convention has just decreed it. But no, the soldiers explain, if they'd come to do that, they'd have brought more men. It's a sinister encounter, made more so by one soldier's oblique reference to Robespierre and his passion for conspiracy. That same armed man then offers to escort Camille home, or as he puts it, to take him to a place of greater safety. To this offer, Camille replies twice, only half joking, the grave. In the fragile world of Paris, 1793, the only real place of refuge is not on this earth, but of another. The meanings of place here are more metaphoric than literal, more spectral than spatial, but even then the title's evacuation of the word place reminds one of how Mantel's first drafted historical novel emphasizes a dense web of primarily social rather than spatial connections. What I mean by this is that A Place of Greater Safety is a novel mostly of and about relationships friendships, affairs, relations of care and betrayal, rivalries and partnerships, menage and petty hatreds. To be sure, most of this social relation tends to happen in Parisian rooms. This is a very indoors kind of novel. But these scenes, many of them dominated by dialogue, are attended by minimal elaboration of setting and evince little interest in geography as a determinative aspect of plot or character, or as a means through which character psychology might be expressed. In this, I'm gonna suggest, lies one of the major differences between A Place of Greater Safety and Mantel's Wolf Hall trilogy, a series of books in which the mutual constitution of character and place is essential to their form and meaning. Here's an example of what I mean about A Place of Greater Safety. 
One day in the autumn of 1793, Maximilien Robespierre interrogates Farber de Eglantin about the rapidly unraveling French East India Company scandal. The location for this scene is barely sketched out. It is the morning and we are in a committee room in an unspecified building. There is a table and chairs. Robespierre and Farbe sit centrally with the other unnamed committee men having scooted back to make room. Such scanty detail quickly established, the rest of the scene is all dialogue, with only a few words here or there to establish context and sequence. Farbre is slumped in his chair. Farbre swallowed. Robespierre looked around the table, expecting no contradiction. After a while, Robespierre moves Fabre to another, a smaller office in which they may speak privately. The change of setting again necessitates only the briefest detour in the flow of speech. We are told that the room has a door, which one ought to keep open as a precaution against eavesdroppers. We know that the room is small, barely furnished, but not dusty. And we know that Fabre thinks Robespierre has a series of such spaces set aside in public buildings for his use. Still, Mantel's narrator again tells us nothing about which building we're in now. She wastes minimal time on architecture or decor, light or smell, what is near or what is far away. There are no gratuitous reality effects in Roland Barthes' phrase, in a scene of almost five pages. No details dropped in pursuit of period authenticity, no nods and winks to the reader that, hey, this is the really real. What matters is Robespierre's voice, which fills up all diegetic space beyond the little left open for Fab's replies. The small room serves less as a realized place and more like the novelistic equipment equivalent of a hothouse or a vitrine, intensifying and making visible the same social dynamic that was apparent in the large committee room in the earlier part of the scene. Robespierre bullying and persuading and correcting. Farb hedging and trimming, trying all he can not to drown in the rapids of revolution. I hope the example is clear. In another novel, one could easily imagine Robespierre's committee rooms meriting long passages of description, becoming something like an objective correlative for his tyrannical appetite for work and for the revolution's slide in political tyranny. In another novel, those rooms might exert a shaping force on Robespierre's personality, operating as what, discussing Balzac, Eric Auerbach named milieu, a kind of atmospheric realism in which setting becomes an organic and demonic entity, at once total and necessary to the novel's formal operations and effective character. But Mantel has crafted not milieu, but situations generalizable social spaces within which mostly people talk and talk and talk their brilliant and self-deluding talk. At key moments, it seems worth pointing out, the narrative frame of a place of greater safety sometimes drops away and the text resorts to the mere back and forth dialogue of a play script. So we're left with only dialogue and no mise en scène, right? No representation of setting. This is another way of saying that a place of greater safety is primarily structured around the homosocial tri triangle, Danton, Desmoulins, Robespierre, than around a geographic set of relationships such as Paris, London, Vienna, or nation, borderland, enemy, or even the dualistic spatial relationship that we might expect to prove formative, given that Mantel's three main characters all comes from the sticks. And that's the binary relationship province metropole or province's capital. In a longer version of this talk, I would spend more time exploring that last dynamic between Paris and the provinces, comparing these qualities of setting in Mantel's novel to other historical fictions about the French Revolution, perhaps especially Daphne du Maurier's The Glass Blowers from 1963, which is set during the war in the Vendée and so moves the central site of revolutionary struggle from Paris to the provinces. But I confess that these days I write a lot of administrative emails and have not yet done that work. And so instead, let me move to some more familiar ground, uh, and that's the ground of Wolf Hall. If you're interested in the extended version of the argument that I'm going to summarize and then try and move beyond a little bit uh, today, um, then Kevin has already been nice enough to plug my book or mention my book, which I'm now plugging, Extraterritorial, A Political Geography of Contemporary Fiction, the fourth chapter of which has an extended 
argument focusing on the historical novels of Mantel and of the Indian uh, novelist Amitabh Ghosh. So the short version of the argument in the book uh, goes something like this. Franco Moretti contends that the settings of the 19th century historical novel contributed to the work of national state making by tending to cluster away from the center and in the vicinity of borders. In so doing, Moretti claims, the genre represents the historical internal unevenness of bourgeois states as they were developing across the 18th and 19th century. And that's the way that they were actually, despite the claims of romantic nationalists, neither homogeneous, uh, spatial nor temporal volumes. The trick is that the historical novel genre admits such unevenness only then to abolish it at the level of plot and symbol. And so Edward Waverley in uh, Scott's novel uh, of that name marries Rose Bradwardine and the union is saved. Flora McIver, uh, his Highlander uh, romantic interest from earlier in the novel, enters a convent and the archaic romance and threat of the Highlander recedes. But while the classic historical novel embodies for Moretti the symbolic form of the national state, Wolf Hall, I would suggest, questions the assumption at the heart of this literary historical tale. It questions, that is, the idea that the modern state was ever a unitary territorial state at all. In Wolf Hall, international borders do not exist at the edge of the territory. They're instead distributed throughout public and private space. Wolf Hall's genre space is an involute zone in which distinctions between inside and outside, Italian and Englishman, are at once mobile and determinate, a zone in which formal qualities of character and voice become extricable from those of its setting. Again, this somewhat tricky attitude to setting is signaled by the novel's title, which names an estate, Wolf Hall, which is never depicted in that text, at least in the first volume of the trilogy, and which only comes to the fore right at its end. But that aside, the territor territorializing logic of Wolf Hall can be nicely illustrated by the legal question of Premanyaya, which concerns whether a kingdom can tolerate multiple sovereignty claims. In Wolf Hall, the problem of Premanyaya first applies to the king's case against Thomas Wolsey, whose dual allegiances to England and Rome embody the tension between territorial and extraterritorial forms of power, which we can here understand in terms of the distinction between the Pope's claim to have authority over all Christian persons, no matter their location, and Henry's claim to supremacy over all subjects within his territory, no matter their other allegiances. When Wolsey falls from grace, he is indicted under the statute of asserting a foreign jurisdiction in the king's realm. But even before writs are moved against him, we've already heard Wolsey described as a kingly kind of man. Quote, he used to say, the king will do such and such. Then he began to say, we will do such and such. And now he says, this is what I will do. In the figure of Wolsey, butcher's son and aspirant pope, faithful Englishman and alter rex, we find embodied the period's constitutive conflicts between distinct but overlapping sovereignty re regimes, one national and territorial, its edges coterminous with the coastline and the Scottish border, the other supranational and extraterritorial, applying wherever the church asserts its rights and immunities. Wolsey's destruction and later Thomas More's exemplifies how the novel's central marital drama is resolved by Cromwell so as to finally unify England's political geography, which, excepting the brief interlude of Mary Tudor's reign, will henceforth no longer be split along temporal and spiritual lines. And so one way of describing Wolf Hall is as a lightly skeptical episode out of English Whig history in which a proto-Westphalian form of state sovereignty emerges from the providential accidents of Henry's marriage bed. And here I would refer to Kevin's remarks in his paper uh, where he referenced uh, the influence of, of both uh, G.R. Elton's thought and Mary Robertson's own historical work on Mantell and the way in which we can read Wolf Hall as contributing to a kind of ongoing histori historical argument about Cromwell's and Henry VIII's and the Tudor period more generally uh, role and function and importance in the history of English state formation, and especially in the idea that the, the period marks a kind of transitional point 
between uh, the late medieval and the early modern period, or especially a sort of transitional point into something like a modern English national state. So that argument, uh, the one I was just referring to and which Kevin also referred to is consistent with many elements in the novel. Mantell's Cromwell doesn't resist Rome for purely factional or doctrinal reasons, but rather because he believes sincerely that it is past time to, quote, say what England is, her scope and boundaries, her capacity for self-rule, what a king is and what trust and guardianship he owes his people. The novel's diction as it moves towards the end becomes increasingly national, reaching out to include, quote, the people on the Scottish borders and the Welsh marches, the men of Cornwall, as well as the men of Sussex and Kent. And we have to remember here that Cromwell is perhaps the most important figure in the period in terms of unifying the administrative and legal structure of England and Wales. In Wolf Hall's final scene, territorial consolidation is them thematized explicitly at the level of governmental power knowledge. And so as Cromwell plans the King's summer progress to the Seymour's estate, he meditates on, quote, the need for better maps that show where the bridges are, the distance between them and how far you are from the sea. But Mantell is a good historian. She knows that Cromwell's reforms left untouched many aspects of late medieval government. Power in Wolf Hall is not merely territorial. It is still deeply bound up in personal charisma and personal authority. Wolf Hall is full of worries, for instance, about the king's two bodies, both of them, the corporeal and the political. In fact, Wolf Hall is lousy with the language of personhood, so lousy, in fact, that the word person comes to rival England or Henry as its defining lexical principle. The Duke of Norfolk first includes the language of, introduces the language of personhood um, to the novel expecting deference from Cromwell, but meeting only polite self-composure, he bursts out, damn it all, Cromwell, why are you such a person? Later in the same chapter, the Duke erupts, you person, you nobody from hell, you horseborn, you cluster of evil, you lawyer. The Duke of Norfolk is always the best one to be quoting. It's a nicely weighted epithet, this word person, it allows Norfolk to at once acknowledge Cromwell's curious social weight. Thomas, says the king to his counselor, it is like hugging a sea wall. At the same time as it allows Norfolk to put him in his place as merely a person. But although Norfolk introduces this lexical note, this person, he can't control it. The epithet expands and in expanding, it affirms Cromwell's unflappable flexibility. As we should expect, Cromwell is the first to get in on the personhood act. When Stephen Gardner spitefully asks what title he goes by, he replies placidly, a person. The Duke of Norfolk says, I'm a person. Next, the narrator joins in, notarizing Cromwell's alliance with Thomas Cranmer. Quote, they embrace cautiously, Cambridge scholar, person from Putney. Cranwell, Cranmer himself, compliments Cromwell as, quote, a person of great force and will. And best of all, there's Cromwell's own meditation on personhood. Quote, there are some people in this world, he thinks, who like everything squared up and precise, and there are those who will allow some drift at the margins. He is both these kinds of person. The labiality of Cromwell's policy and person is produced by Wolf Hall's narrative voice, as well as by its diction. The narrator's close third person perspective is not in itself unusual. Less common though is Mantell's persistent use of the present tense. And here Kevin and I are again thinking in the same way, which performs the trick of making historical events seem still in development. More unusually still, the narrator reinforces Cromwell's intense but flexible personhood by doubling and tripling down on the pronomial he. This is a hard quality to evince without quoting great chunks from the text, but we can try. So on one page of a long chapter in Wolf Hall, we encounter three paragraphs that describe Cromwell at work. He sits at his desk, piled high with drawings, begins the first. He opens a letter, begins the second. He reads, begins the third. And while we might feel that this narrator is unusually focused on everyday desk work, the threefold pronominal pattern doesn't seem by itself unusual. The kicker is that within these three short paragraphs, each of them introduced with the phrase he and then a verb, 
he is always used to refer to Cromwell. Um, he is used to refer to Cromwell an additional 12 times, right? So we have 15 uses of the pronoun across three short paragraphs. He always comes at the start of a sentence and it's always followed by an action verb. So there's a lot of he in these three paragraphs and he does a lot of stuff. Proper nouns in these passages are sometimes employed, but only to name other people or places. Cromwell's own name is never used. In all, Mantell's reiterative pronominal style produces a sense of Cromwell's omnipresence and omnicompetence. After all that he, Cromwell seems to come, comes to seem less like any man or every man and more like the only man we need. And so Wolf Hall contains two apparently contrary kinds of formal and spatial logic. The first is geographic, impersonal, and a matter of setting, plot, and argument. It's predicated on political powers, abstraction, and extension across national space. The second logic inheres in Wolf Hall's diction and in its narrative voice, and it's individuated and individuating. The first works away at the kind of internal border epitomized by the problem of conflicting jurisdictions, that the presence of a person like Wolsey uh, epitomizes. But the second logic mitigates the novel's impression that modern political power must be invested in and across territory rather than in and over the extraterritorial movements of people. But of course, these logics are not really contrary any more than modern conceptions of individual rights are antithetical to forms of territorial jurisdiction. And so in Wolf Hall, the spatial and the personal come together finally in the body of the protagonist, as when the narrator describes the courtier's impression that Cromwell, quote, can contain the fears of other men and give them a sense of solidity in a quaking world, this people, this dynasty, this miserable rainy island at the edge of the world. That sentence is progression from Cromwell's personhood onwards until it finally encompasses the whole island of Britain, embodies an expansive scalar drama in which Cromwell's personal qualities allow people to feel rooted, and by feeling rooted, allows them to locate themselves within a series of progressively larger frames that end with the geographic terms island, edge, world. For it is Thomas Cromwell, who else, who formally unifies Wolf, Wolf Hall's different logics of power, and so ensures the symbolic coherence of a great novel that wants to be about state-making, but has no interest in insular nationalisms. While the present tense action of Wolf Hall is almost all domestic, with the exception of that one long scene in Calais, it's a very English novel, Cromwell the man is fundamentally shaped by his foreign experiences. As we know, service is, he serves as a mercenary uh, for Louis XII, which takes him to Italy and eventually to Florence and then to Antwerp. He earns a place in the networks of commercial and cultural exchange that center on those great banking and mercantile cities. This Cromwell is the kind of man, quote, prone to start a sentence in one language and finish it in another. Cromwell, the state maker, is also the agent of an incipiently global network of finance, trade and empire. He arranges loans on the international market and he knows that the world is now run from Antwerp and Florence and from Lisbon rather than from his antagonist's great country estates. This Cromwell gets homesick for Italy and when his fellow Londoners riot against foreigners, he remembers that he himself had not long been home. His identification with Europe is crucial to his unifying formal and ideological purpose in the novel. I am always translating, he thinks to himself one day, if not language to language, then person to person. His nation building enterprise is not built on doctrines of insular autarky. For while he helps sever the, bank, the links between England and Rome, he deepens the traffic between the city of London and the banks of Florence and Genoa. Territorial sovereignty in general depends upon relations of political and economic independence with other states. It means nothing without a conception of an interstate system, underwritten by legal notions of formal equality that are epitomized in the contractual exchange of commodities as much as in emerging international 
diplomatic norms. In saying this, I'm making a theoretical claim about the continuing inter interdependence of extraterritorial forms of authority with notions of territorial power that emerged in part from the Reformation's alignment, realignments of spiritual and temporal power. That's the big historical argument of Exoterritorial's fourth chapter. But I'm also trying to get at Wolf Hall's formal geographical disposition, and I'm eager to celebrate what I think of as one of Mantell's signature accomplishments in the Wolf Hall novels. These are grand historical novels that are curiously intimate. They offer a version of deep English history and identity that is defined by the way that those novels and their characters open out onto the world. There are those novels that like everything squared up and precise, and there are those that allow some drift at the margins. Wolf Hall is both those kinds of novel. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. That was fascinating. Um, we are moving on to the Q&A now. So if any of you have any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, I think we have some questions for you, Matt. Uh, let's start. Okay, so there's one concerning uh, your use of the term omnicompetent to describe Cromwell, an echo of Elton's point about the omnicompetence of statute as an achievement of the 1530s. So. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, Steve. I hadn't thought about that connection. Um, I have to confess that I think that I reached for the word omnicompetence simply because of the rhyme with omnipotence. So there are always those, you know, it's a rightly thing, right? There are always those aspects of your argument that seem conceptually or historically astute to somebody else. But I have to confess that often it might be the musicality or the rhythm of a phrase that brings me to one word rather than another. Um, but, but I take the point. I mean, I think that, that in the larger point, is, which is to say, I think that, that, that in much of the historiography that, that Mantell is obviously interested and invested in, whether that's older material like Elton's or whether that's you know, a more contemporary historic or historian and biographer like McCulloch, um, much of that research focuses on Cromwell's mastery of detail and also mastery of statute. The fact that he is experienced in the House of Commons before he comes into the ministry, the fact that much of his work with Woolsey um, involved, is, is the work of a fixer or in Kevin's term or middleman. Um, and then once he enters into the ministry under, under Henry, I think it's, and, and Mantell is obviously very interested in this aspect of his work, um, his, his ability to govern the commons um, and to craft legislation as much as it is to, for instance, you know, negotiate loans. Um, that's crucial to his ability to wield power and, and to wield power by being useful to Henry, um, which is of course both his great strength as a courtier and ultimately his weakness, that he has no constituency, no power base outside of his relationship to the king. And so therefore is vulnerable um, in the final instance as a result of that. Um, so yeah, I, I, I absolutely understand why for someone like Elton, Cromwell, Cromwell's own competence, his omnicompetence is directly linked to the way in which statute law becomes decisive uh, in the way in which the English Reformation is framed with, I think, consequences that Henry certainly didn't foresee for the direction of English constitutional development and government over the remainder of the Tudor period and the Stuart um, dynasty also. Uh, I think there's another question for you. Uh, Lucy asks uh, about the relationship between the way Mantle's Tudor novels trouble the trend for the rendering heterogeneous, the space of the nation, and the way embodied nationality slash identity is represented in the novels. Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm actually eager to, to, to maybe pass this over to Kevin. I know there's another uh, question for Kevin in the chat, just in part because I think, I, I suspect that Kevin has thought more about these questions of embodiment than I have, because they seem important to his interest in theatricality. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to defer to Kevin on this. And if I, I think of something while he's answering, I'll, 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 I'll pick it up after that. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, uh, Matt, I, I honest to goodness had not read your chapter uh, while drafted. I, I want to get any sort of accus accusations of plagiarism out of the way. Uh, I wrote this during the pandemic. You know, the libraries weren't working the way they're supposed to. And I read it and I was like, nope. 
It's, so great, it's great work, Kevin. I am delighted to be associated with it in any way. Yeah. Uh, anyway, a lot of uh, a lot of reverberations. Let's put it that way. When I started reading it a couple weeks ago, um, I think sort of sort of my way into thinking about this, and this goes to the question, the other question Lucy posed, sort of about um, gesturing, is um, the whole project that I'm working on across all the different chapters is about genre, and I really come at uh, the sort of novels, the contemporary novels that I'm working on. Uh, from a perspective of a slightly more popular way of thinking about things. So less, uh, you know, Waverly and Balzac and Scott and more um, Bridgerton and Outlander and the real costumey drama type uh, way of thinking about things. And I think that really one of the things that I think draws people to a particular form of historical staginess is both this like recognizability and familiarity with uh, national cultures that are sort of untroubled, um, that there is something really robust about uh, tapping into a reservoir of, of national res like reference culture, things like that. What I'm interested in is how Mantel then takes that as an access point for readers. Like England is recognizable. There is a period drama element to this. We can sort of build and connect to a, a robust sort of national culture and then in involutes it inside, involutes a word that that Matt used about sort of the evolution of the geographic space. I'm also thinking about how does Mantell take England and rework it from our perspective now without necessarily disaggregating or disrupting uh, the contemporary coherent position of the nation. Um, I'm thinking in terms of specifically written around Brexit and rising calls of xenophobia, nationalism, and I think there is a counter that says, no, we've always been international. How dare you? We well, sort of dis dissolves into a, uh, a permanent space of internationalism or complete heterogeneity. And it always has been. So stop with the borders, stop with all the xenophobia. But something that is really active and I think really gives meaning and shape to the way people think about things is the like ideological frame of the nation that we are sort of born in. And I think one of the things that Mantel is doing is, is activating that same frame and then reworking the joints of it and saying, you can still be English. We can, the nation can still exist. We're just gonna redefine what it was from its inception. And that's sort of from this current perspective going backwards. Um, so I think it is, obviously they're in a relation with one another. I think Matt and some of the other papers we've talked about have done a really good job of saying like, how is this moving teleologically from the past to now? And I'm really thinking about what is Mantel doing with the, the costume drama now and how is she going back and rewriting the history? Uh, so they're basically kind of two projects working in opposite directions uh, through time. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the space of the nation and the embodied nationality, I think that is really the, the kind of the point is it's both at the same time. Um, and I think specifically the theatricality of it really activates it in a particular way. Uh, and so that she can undermine it. Uh, that's another question for you, Kevin, regarding um, the, the gestures, uh, the significance of gestures for the characters. The self-conscious gestures speak to your argument or is it serving a different purpose in your opinion? Um, yeah. Um, just really quickly, I hadn't actually sort of, well, while building the argument, I hadn't really noticed, to be honest, noticed that or, or thought really deeply about it, but I think it's obviously of a piece, um, you know, we, the sort of the embodied present of the actors on stage in the sort of the narrative sense, the pronouns and, uh, and the present tense, obviously would also, we think of them as actors on the stage. I mean, as the talk with Ben Miles sort of walked us through or the conversation Lucy, you were talking uh, you know, these were not initially written for the stage, but there is something about them that is eminently adaptable uh, to them. And I think this sense of all these characters as being embodied in space, physically, literally embodied gestures, all of those sort of things is something that's running through and is something that allowed them to be so easily adapted, but is not necessarily, um, they were not written for the stage, but they were able to be translated to it so easily and so effectively. Uh, all right, moving on to Eleanor, a uh, couple of questions for you. Uh, could you speak more about Margaret Buford's annotated great book, not only how it contributes to a sense of ending uh, and to the influence of women's text in Mantle's trilogy? Uh, 
Um, hi, thank you. Um, yeah, she's a, obviously a, a reference in that chapter that seeks to, I guess, juxtapose a whole set of um, structures of the state that run through the discussions that obviously Cromwell tries to have with, with Henry, but I was struck yesterday by somebody saying the one thing um, that Cromwell can't do, of course, is to produce the baby himself. But this issue of who can produce the baby comes to um, that all the other sort of state structures that we're looking at in these texts are kind of held, of course, but in, in, in the grip of this other uncontrollable um, phenomenon, which is constantly, I think, producing, I argue anyway, in my sort of broader paper, um, this sense of dread. All pregnancy is a form of um, dread and torment leading to this predicted end. And the question is, what will the end be? Um, and of course, there have been so many terrible endings that um, punctuate um, the novel and in, influence, of course, every the fate of many of many people, and of course, influence Cromwell's fate. Um, the Beaufort book, although I haven't done a lot of work um, on, I'm not a sort of historical um, writer, but the Beaufort book, of course, this um, is 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 mentioned in the novel as being both a a text that must be adhered to, has to be read, and has to, the, the, the teachings of it have to be followed, but it's also of a kind of dubious quality. As Henry says, um, she suffered terribly in childbirth. Um, so she, the, the text is um, annotated by her, this sort of sense that she's put her experience into text. And it seems to relate to these other texts that surround the body. That the, the pregnant body has prayers strapped to it or put on the wrist. The text is really important element of this incredibly physical, um, biological experience. It's not, it's not straightforwardly biological, it's highly freighted by, by different kinds of textuality. Um, I'd be really interested in, in spending more time on the, uh, on the Beaufort um, annotated text itself, though, to see if there were other ways in which that's being used in the novel. Uh, another question for you, Eleanor. Um, there's, there's a question about the idea of transcendence. Uh, the references you made uh, about, uh, you know, uh, in, in the trilogy and how it compares and uh, the anticipation of dread and what is to come. So, uh, this person is wondering if you had any thoughts on transcending to different forms as we move from one world to another. And Cromwell is very much like through Mantle's novels. So it inhabits a different space to physical presence. So if you could. So I'm just quickly reading that question because it's quite long. Yes. Um, oh gosh, thank you for that question. Um, um, yes, I think um, the uh, the sense of um, a kind of, I guess, an, a, a women's time running through the novels that 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 works very differently to the, um, the structures of state power is an interesting way again to perhaps think about what what Ali Smith's done. As I said, I think the, the works are extremely different on some levels, but they are both state of the nation um, texts in different ways, arguably as well. And I think hers, Alice Smith's novels that sought to write through and, and ended up getting, I guess, hijacked firstly by Brexit and then to an extent by the pandemic were not supposed to be about either of those two things directly. Indeed, they were supposed to be about seasonality. Um, and they were an experiment in formal writing, writing the present moment um, as quickly as possible. And yet, of course, when we see what goes on in, in, in Mantel's work, that um, her, her skill is to turn 
is to bring the, the, the present back, um, the past back as the present. She comments as well, fascinatingly, on, on this being a very physical property that she has, that she has precise sensory recall, she says, about her own past, that um, she has a faculty, she says it's a disturbing faculty. She doesn't have a protective barrier against the past, but she's decided to see that as a gift and to use it. So she not only has access to very clear and precise memories of her own, say, childhood moments that are reflected through sensorial experiences, which I think is interesting because she uses those so much in the novels to try and retain, uh, sort of reclaim and, and, and reanimate the past. But she also says, if you can do it for yourself, you can do it for an invented character. So as a narrative strategy, she says, I go and live in their body. In the longer paper, I try and talk about that a little bit more and about um, being uh, imaginatively living in some of these bodies, particularly living in bodies that are giving birth um, and how she does that. But um, that's only a very perhaps tangential answer to your question, but um, I think that that would be some initial thoughts that I have on that. And lastly, um, Matthew has a question for Eleanor. Yeah, regarding, I can, uh, yeah, you can directly ask her, I think. No, uh, I was, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was, thank you, Anna, for the paper. I really enjoyed it. And I was, I was especially interested in the, the moment which you reminded me of Mantel's dislike of the analogy between the Reformation and Brexit um, and resisting the attempt to sort of think about the topical resonances of, of the Wolf Hall trilogy in the context of, of 2016 and, and everything that came after. Um, and I was interested in hearing your thoughts about that. I, I have to say, I find it a kind of unconvincing argument as if like what's going on here is that Mantella approves of the yeah. Reformation and she doesn't approve yeah. of Brexit. And so she wants us to keep the two of them separate. Whereas clearly there are structurally, right? There are the things mm -hmm. to do with the relationship between state sovereignty and supranational yes. political yes, institutions. Absolutely. And it's the Treaty of Rome, for goodness sake. Yes. I, I completely agree with your argument um, that throughout the throughout the novels, Cromwell is the European. He is the absolute pro-European figure, but he understands Europe differently. He speaks multiple languages. He's moved and um, he's been allied to different yep. um, armies, and um, he's a he's absolutely understood the sort of international frame. And I think the the references that he makes, the the, the gestures towards Europe, to the food, to um, language, to the great relationships that he has with the, with, um, the different um, ambassadors from different locations, all point to that. Um, also on a very practical level, Mantel's own decision to move to Ireland in order to remain European and to reclaim her Irishness. Um, somebody was saying in a paper yesterday, was it, was it Eileen was saying about um, the giant O'Brien saying, yep. I was trying to write this novel and then I suddenly remembered I was Irish and then I was able to write it. Um, so I think that sort of idea of remembering your Irish and we're all trying to remember our European connections if we have any, um, that, that uh, I, I think it's, she decides not to put her cards on the table maybe there, but I don't think the novels get away with it. I think they reveal quite clearly um, a, a, a a, re a revision of that moment of history, which insists that there was always a European or a cosmopolitan culture um, right. in the face of the sort of nationalistic discourses that we've seen emerging. So yeah, can, I'm sorry, a clear pro project on her part. May I sneak in one more question? Mark Shudder, would that be okay for Eleanor? It was, again, it's related. To, <laughs> I, I'm a, sure, also a big ahead. reader of the Smith, um, seasonal quartet and have been teaching those novels as they've been coming out. Um, I wondered, that, I was thinking about the ending of Summer, which I found unsatisfying, and yet I don't know how it could have been anything other than unsatisfying, because it seems in that series of novels, there are two weird things happening at the level of time, right? One is the seasonality, which is essentially endless. It could just, you could just go on forever, right? Because that's the nature of seasonal time, it's cyclical. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the, the the contemporaneity, right? The idea that these are novels about a particular time and about a particular transition, which having having happened won't happen again, and the world will be changed in some way. The other side of that transition, and those things are always going to be an intention. 
And so I, I, my generous reading of this is that I feel like the last novel, everything gets tied together too neatly, but what else could you do? Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I was interested in, because I know you had to focus because of time on the ending of, of Mirror and the Light, which has a different mm -hmm. kind of narrative problem, right? The one you discussed that we already know what's going to happen to our, our beloved Thomas Cromwell. Um, but what were your thoughts about the ending of Summer as the conclusion of that, that, that four novel sequence? Oh gosh, yes. Well, it is a real, it is a, it is a real problem clearly for for Smith that um, the ending isn't in any meaningful sense the end. There right. isn't an ending, and she's writing as close to the present as she possibly can. But at the same time, uh, the new cycle that she's she's writing in, no matter how quickly there is a turnaround in that publication of the final novel, it still doesn't feel. That you're reading it on the same day that it was written that you there's right. still a gap at the end and the preoccupation of course which is part of her own i guess her own her own life story at that time was working with refugee tales and working with a series of collections about um telling refugee stories so her her affiliation to that and to ending with um the most positive view that she could have on a very mm but on a micro level really isn't it? it's a personal level about two people managing to sort of deal with the rising xenophobic um horror of sort of british public life and this is her um individual plea i don't want to say for kindness because i think everywhere at the moment the sort of um motif like, be kind her sort of drenched our interactions on most things but that there is this sense of that, interper that friendship let's say that, that right. friendship is um and hospitality which is another i think central concern that she has yeah. become but but they're, they're thematic there isn't a proper ending there isn't a conclusion apart from that we have a character of course you've, you've read them all um we have a character who is a hundred years, oh, I think he's 103 by the end of the final novel, Daniel Gluck, um, a Jewish character who can remember his whole life and, and history and so gives us enough space to go back and forth in time. Mm. Whereas of course at the end of the novel we're very much sort of in the writing the very present as, as close as she can get. But no, it's it's not satisfying in that yeah. sense. The quartet <laughs> model isn't a satisfying, seasonal model isn't satisfying. The death of Cromwell probably is, although I know yeah. there have been some um, reviews saying that that, that that text is too, that the final novel is too big, it's too bloated, it tries to do too much. And therefore is also the, the dread that I think she's good at writing is a little bit um, foreshortened. There isn't enough dread. Right. Um, or it just is really hard to surprisingly kill somebody who's been condemned to death and we know about it. We really fundamentally know it. So unless we can- And who died 500 years ago. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's common knowledge, you know. So <laughs> it, unless we can get to that point where we forget it, um, which of course he, it, once he knows, once he knows then we're all in it, aren't we? Sorry, that was my thoughts. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, all right, uh, I think uh, we have another question um, for both Matt and Kevin. Uh, I think this one should, um, I, either of you can answer this, is talking about, it's more of an observation that's talking about how uh, the perspective intersperses the knowledge of past events and is seamlessly it blends with the present consciousness, which I think is a running theme, and especially in Kevin's and Eleanor's uh, papers. You know, you both talk about how past is present and present is past. I think that is what Kevin had said in his paper that uh, the virtual space is embodied as now, right? Uh, so I think that is a, a running observation throughout her work, the way she talks about. Um, time. And that also forms a big part of my own paper, which is looking at her autobiography. But uh, is there something you'd like to add to that, perhaps? Um, Eleanor? Uh, um, um, well, yes, I guess um, I, I, at least partially, I guess I'm a a Derridean, um, 
with many caveats. But um, that question of where do ghosts come from and the, the sense of things coming from the future, um, I, I think I was just really interested in um, the confusions of time, but particularly I think in the last novel, where, where these moments that I identify where dread is a word, where it's actually spoken, one person says that they dread something to another, they normally then produce um, a really horrible, vivid memory for Cromwell. So the dread um, that is spoken in the very first example, he then goes right back to remembering seeing somebody be burned alive. Um, so the, the, they're markers, they're markers of um, really truly traumatic events that keep on happening, but which are also booked to happen in the future, that have already been booked in and in terms of the date and the time that they're going to happen. So we're in that fantastic place where we know that um, and he doesn't, but he, he gets so close to knowing it. He gets so close to being able to sort of see his, his end through his relation to these other traumas. And that happens again and again when he interviews people that he produces this dread in them. They know that their hour is, is coming, but quite clearly also um, it's his hour that's coming. So I think, yes, the, the circularity is fascinating. In, um, it, it's not that dissimilar to what Ali Smith's doing. She's doing something really interesting with chopping different memories, intersecting different memories of, and different times until a picture comes together. They're very, very dispersed and much more polyvocal than the, these texts, which, as everybody's noted, keep um, Cromwell so present and in the, in the present tense and so much behind his eyes, so embodied. Um, but I think there is a similarity nonetheless in, in, its, um, in the way in which memory repeats um, or in which trauma repeats or re reenacted, perhaps. I don't know if Kevin wants to talk about. Yeah, that I think the sort of the Derridian haunting that runs through all of this, I think is, is really essential. I also just think about Cromwell himself and what he does and how he operates. This is a little bit of a, a left field, but when I, I think of Cromwell, I, oft, I think a lot about a character from another novel, which is completely distinct, but might be familiar to some other people, which is Remainder by, um, oh my God, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, oh Tom McCarthy, of course, but there's the there's Nas, the sort of the the facilitator, and what he does is his ability to completely understand all the machinations of everything, and to sort of process it and plot it. So I, <clears throat> if Cromwell is a fixer, I think one of the positions that he needs to hold himself in is this sort of massive international web of everything that has happened, all the like all of the motivations all their interpersonal interactions. I mean, the sense of dread so often comes, I think, in the trilogy with Thomas Cromwell and sitting down and basically being like, I, you know that I know what's up. Like, I know who you've talked to. I know that your great uncle's sister's brother, whatever. And there's no negotiation. Like, I've already figured this out. <clears throat> which I think also speaks to the ending of Cromwell, which is that he doesn't actually have any power except that he understands how power works. There is no, he doesn't have a constituency to himself. And I think this bundling of the present tense and the past is his marshalling of just knowledge and power to the end of being able to plan and move forward, but without ever actually having any sort of power or martial uh, backing to himself. And I think there's a real, I just get the sense of there's a real bundling of things together and a sorting out and a weaving of it. Um, but once those strands sort of come undone, then there's nothing left for him. Um, and I think that proceeds backwards in time and forwards into how he imagines things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. hey, Mark, would you like to add something to that? Or? Yeah, I, I just think gen the only thing I would say generally is that I think that there are lots of ways I think you can explore the diff lots of differences that would be interesting to explore in terms of the way that things like memory haunting uh, memory both individual and collective let's put it in the broadest terms like that operate in 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 the wolf hall novels or in mantel's fiction more generally but i think it, to to go back to eleanor's parallel right where we're thinking about ali smith in relation to, to to wolf hall one of the things 
I find ultimately frustrating and very charming about Smith's work is the way in which it traffics in something like the sort of quasi supernatural. There are a lot of characters in her work that have the sort of figure of a sort of fairy element or a trickster element. They make things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. Um, Spring is very much organized around such a character. Um, and that allows wonderful things to happen, wonderful surprises to happen at the level of event um, and at the level of narrative structure. But sometimes it seems, I mean, quite literally detached from reality. Historical novels have the opposite problem, which is to say that everything, we're looking at everything in retrospect and all the things that might have depended upon coincidence and chance an absolute accident in the past seem retrospectively to look like the result of historical conspiracies. Everything seems like it had to happen the way that it happened. And so the problem is escaping from necessity um, and, and, and creating a fictional world in which it seems like contingency still operates and chance still operates. So I just think that both Mantell and, and, and Smith have very different formal and generic problems to address when it comes to the interweaving of the past and the present, and they use different methods to get there. Um, you can tell my aesthetic biases are towards Wolf Hall um, mm -hmm. and, and, and towards, but I understand that part of what makes a novel like the historical novel as a whole seem satisfying from the point of view of cause and effect is the illusion of retros that retrospective knowledge gives you. Um, and as readers, we always have to, and, as, and I'm sure as a writer of the form, which I've never attempted, uh, one always has to bear that in mind. And, um, thank you, all of you. I think, uh, do we have more time? Um, so absolutely. I think we should take a 15 minute break and reconvene at 15 minutes past the hour. So in whichever time zone you are, 15 minutes past the hour. Thank you, Mokshta, for chairing the session and thank you everybody for what was a fantastic conversation. <laughs>